Well, aren't you a regular Nancy Drew? I learned that from the Nancy Drew detective. Okay, go. You think you can follow the clues and solve the case of the missing condiment, Nancy Drew? Fuck. Because I've read every Nancy Drew mystery ever written. Nancy, please tell me you're joking. Wow, you suck at this Nancy Drew stuff. You should get a new hobby. My name is Carson Drew, and this is my assistant, Nancy. 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 It's curtains for you, Miss Drew. Nancy. Nancy Drew strikes again. A regular Nancy Drew. Well, hello, regular Drews. Hi, everyone. (laughs) Welcome to episode 68. Yes, today we are talking about The Invisible Intruder, book number 46. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. (laughs) I have so much to say about this book. Yeah? It's wild. It it really is. (laughs) I think I really enjoyed it at first. Okay. And, and, you know, we start off pretty strong with the sexism. But I thought, okay, well, maybe we're just getting it out of the way. <laughs> no, no. No, we're definitely not. It really just ramps up. And it's so weirdly religious. Yeah, it's very religious. Yeah. I've never read a more like religious Nancy Drew book in my life. I mean, that I remember. Yeah. Like, wow. Like, we actually get a description of a sermon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And like the lessons that we learn there and Nancy starts to relate it back to the case. And oh, yeah. It's like a full on morality tale. Mm -hmm. And just for Nancy to feel superior as well. Like, oh, Uh I'm I'm not one of those immoral bad guys. Uh Uh-huh. I mean, I think and I think the premise, I was really excited about the premise. And I do think that there were moments that I liked the premise. I just think that... um, we didn't need five different haunted locations. We needed three. (laughs) It felt like a lot. Yeah. It was a lot. And also it felt like at a certain point they were just forcing it. Like the fort was just completely unnecessary in my opinion. I think we needed, we needed the camp and maybe the fortune teller place, but we didn't need the, the inn and the bar, their guest house or whatever that place was. And we didn't need the four. We could have just skipped straight on to the, the last house. Yeah. yeah. Um, because it was so, it just got so rushed. At the beginning, I was like even a little bit concerned because I felt like they were really taking their time. And I was like, we've got a lot of places we got to go. We got to pick up this pace because like we're in like chapter four or whatever. And we're still at this camp. Like we need to yeah. like move yeah, on. Yeah, the pacing was weird. Um, And so by the time you get to like the next place, it's like they're there for like the briefest moment and then they just go on. And so it's like, it just felt really weirdly imbalanced and yeah. yeah. So like I was excited about it and I really liked it. I liked the earlier chapters, but then as soon as you get in the middle, I'm like, this is bad. This is so bad. This is so weird and bad. (laughs) Um, but fascinating, honestly. I've, I I was, like, weirdly fascinated because of how it just felt so strange for a Nancy Drew book. Like, it felt it did. so uh, untypical of the rest of them. Very different. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So this one was published in 1969, and I had to look up the exact date. Um, it was published on January 1st, actually, but I had to look up the date because it felt so much like a Halloween special. Mm-hmm. That, like like if it was a TV show on in the 60s, like this would have right. been the Halloween episode kind of thing. It would have made feels, a good episode of TV. Yeah, it feels very much like a Halloween book. Unfortunately, uh, the scariest parts of the book is just how sexist everything is and how sexist <laughs> the world is that Nancy's living in. Um, yeah, but true, eh. unfortunately. So, but but it's very, very different in structure. And it felt like it was doing that like on purpose to be, okay, we're building up this like spooky thing. But it is still the like the cliche of, oh, all the mysteries are going to come come together and connect at the very end of everything. So you do kind of expect that, but it does feel a little disjointed until yeah. you see how it all connects. So I don't know. 
I mean, I'm like simultaneously of two minds about it. Like I feel like it, it is disjointed, but I think it's just, I think the thing about it is that feels like for a Nancy Drew book at this point, we should know what we're doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we we're this is number 46 we said. And of course readers of these books are going to know all these different places they're connected. Of course we're going to know that. Um and so it does it does feel a little bit like they're trying to do both. Like they're trying to connect them all but they're also trying to make them distinct. And that feels sloppy. It feels sloppy. It's like if it's all, it, it truly is the same story at every single location. And it becomes obvious that it is the same story at every location because Nancy just basically immediately gets there and is like, oh yeah, this is exactly the same situation as what was happening before. And so it's right. like, well, then why are we doing it? Like, why do we have so many? Like, I can understand three. I can get three. But five? I can't get behind five. Yeah. For a 20-chapter book, that's way too much. And it's not well executed because it's like you you should know what you're doing. You should know the, the formula. You should know we've got 20 chapters here. We have to have a quick pace. And we have a lot of information that we have to fit in there. So we should not make such an expansive scope here and we should also like we should be able to have a different mystery at each one that keeps us kind of like confused without us being like totally like this is completely random you know right so i just feel like it just didn't do just didn't do it didn't do didn't do the job of a nancy drew book and all of the weirdness that they put in there of like the religion, which I have never seen in another Nancy Drew book. Um, and it honestly felt like, yeah, like an attempt at a Halloween book, but like a, a non scary one, like, like yeah. a debunk of Halloween is what it felt like it was trying to do. Um, and I, like I get, we do. Right. It felt exactly like Scooby-Doo, like an early Scooby-Doo. And so I thought originally that I would like it because I'm a fan of that. But it felt, I feel like Scooby-Doo holds the supernatural in a place of somewhat respect. Right. Um, this is where not. <laughs> this is not respectful. Like this is like really poo-pooing on anybody or anything that believes in anything even slightly supernatural and um even like the way that like <laughs> they talk about like hauntings and like the concept of it they're like oh this is just like so silly so goofy and it's just like it's just not cool like it's just not cool and it's also not like there, even if it is fake, right? Even if you do have a fake taunting or whatever, the results of it are serious. Like being scared, that's a big deal. Right. Like, or being like threatened, that's a big deal. Those are big associated feelings and effects of even a fake haunting, right? And so to just be like, oh, like you're scared. Uh, it's like, yeah, you know, like they just felt really prickish and like rude, Um and I didn't, I didn't appreciate the tone. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's even, like, it made even worse with the, the character that does believe in this stuff and right, then just ragging Rita. on her the entire book. Yeah. Well, I have so much to say about that. There's so oh, much same. to say about yeah. that. Um, but it just feels like if you're going to make a Halloween book or a Halloweenish spooky haunting book, which cl clearly this was the intent, why would you approach it that way? Like, why would you, it's, it's like, cause it's like doing both at the same time. It's like making that stuff important while simultaneously, simultaneously undercutting it. Right. Why would you even write a book about it if you thought it was so ridiculous and so stupid that you had to disprove it? And with them all being the same thing for all yeah. five of them. I got like halfway through the book and I was like, oh, I see where we're going. Nancy's going to figure it out after like the second place. And then the third place, we're going to use that as an opportunity to trap the villain. And then that's why the pacing is so weird because we're not even really going to get to places four and five. We're just going to maybe at the end, we'll go wrap it up and be like, hey, mm. by the way, this is what was happening. I already figured mm -hmm. it out before I even made it there. I kind of assumed that it was going to yeah. be like, oh, the pacing is so weird because we, we won't ever actually need to get to the fifth place 
nope, nope. It was no. just like, oh, now in this last chapter, we have to make the whole, the, the entire fifth place, this whole thing. And that's when they actually set up the trap and catch the, the bad guys. When it's like you right. knew already who it was going to be and what their next move was going to be. And you chose You literally knew by the, the first place. Yeah. yeah. You just yeah. let it happen. And then, you know, just, just for the sake of saying, oh, we're still going to go to all five places and complete the whatever Helen's plan was. So, mm -hmm. okay. I feel like with including as many different characters on this trip as they did, I thought it was going to be an opportunity for them to um, kind of have Nancy play in the background a little bit more, like mm -hmm. um, solve it without really being super open about what, like she thinks is going on, you know what I okay, mean? Yeah. Um, and like, so that we could still get like these kind of mysterious things, but really Nancy knows what's going on the whole time. She just doesn't share that. Right. Um, and then we get to the final location or whatever, and she lays it out kind of like Velma, a la Scooby-Doo, right? Mm -hmm, you know, yeah. like in Scooby-Doo, Velma has these theories that about what's going on that she doesn't share as they're happening. She just, she'll say something like, uh, what, what is it that she'll say? I don't, I don't remember specifically what she says, but it's clear that like as something's happening that she's thinking about it, she's figuring mm -hmm. something out or like, oh yeah, I have a theory about this or whatever. And then we'll eventually reveal it to everybody at the end when it turns out to be true. And so I thought it was going to be that kind of a situation, but it's not, <laughs> it's not. Um, yeah. It's just an opportunity for everybody to kind of, um, pal around and uh, poke fun at things and fake investigate and for everybody to kind of coddle Nancy um, in a weird way. Um, yeah, so not a huge fan. <laughs> we introduce a lot of additional characters and I feel like the only point of that was so that we could have, you know, one person who's the expert on shells that we didn't, you know, <laughs> Because otherwise Which it's like, not... oh, we'll have to make Bess be that. And she has, isn't already that. That doesn't so make sense. Yeah. Um, but then also to be like, you know, just more examples of sexism. Just have these other women. Because if you'll notice, all the new characters are all married couples. They're not like Nancy and Ned that they're just dating. It's all married couples. And the depiction of marriage in the 60s is maybe maybe actually the scariest part of this book. It's <laughs> so true. It's bleak. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh -huh. Especially, yeah, Rod and Rita really, oh, that's really get to me yeah. in this. And I want to talk about it a lot when we get to the end because it is like, yeah, bleak is like an excellent descriptor. It's the true horror of all of this haunting <laughs> is the marriage depiction mm -hmm. yeah i just i think that there is a way that you could write this book with so much more like sensitivity and still have the same message that you want which is clearly like stealing is wrong and bad and ghosts aren't real yeah you could still get there without just being an absolute dick about it which is what this book does you yeah. know what i mean like you could still I just think the way that the other characters are affected, quote unquote, by all of the supernatural stuff um, is not realistic and um, is not, is just shallow. Um, yeah. It's, it, yeah, because the only two characters that we really see who are affected by it is Bess. Bess, of course, it's constantly teased about it. Um, and Rita, who is also constantly teased about it and that's just not true it's just not true like when you come up against something scary there is nothing shameful about feeling scared right. there is nothing bad about you having different beliefs than other people and you shouldn't be shamed for them and right. told to be quiet about it and um the fact that they can't have a book where people get scared Nancy solves and says, see, there's nothing to be scared of. Or you have people think different things and they aren't allowed to have those beliefs. Like, it's just, you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. they're, they're, they could have done it so much better. Um, but instead, it just feels really snotty. It feels like a snotty book. And I don't oh, like yeah. it. Once again, to no one's surprise, Bess is the main redeeming quality of this book. <laughs> <laughs> she says something really interesting in this book, too. Um, 
about kind of what I'm talking about, about being scared that I want to talk about later as well. I don't remember what that was. Okay. I'm interested. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. But so three words, so many three words, um, shells. I mean the ocean, yeah, like yeah. <laughs> so much. And it literally has no effect, impact, no impact. It doesn't matter at all. It could have been anything, but for some reason it's shells, uh, it's stingrays, um, octopi. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why we're in the Midwest. Yeah. Like yeah. there's the ocean is nowhere near. <laughs> we're very far away. And yet somehow it's a huge plot point in this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the patriarchy or is that yeah. just, yeah. No, I think so. Too spot tired. On. <laughs> um, shells, the patriarchy. And then like traveling, moving, like yeah. we're just, we're, we're driving places so frequently. It's also the Driving. Ned Burton Dave show. Oh God, yes. Oh, that's you're right. That's what it is. It's Ned Burton yeah. Dave. It's it's the boyfriend spectacular. Let's call it, it really that. <laughs> boyfriend spectacular. <laughs> Slash husband, because Jim Archer's there too. <laughs> Whatever. I don't care about him. Yeah. Shells, the patriarchy, and the boyfriend spectacular is a hundred percent what the invisible intruder actually <laughs> is about. We were scared it was going to be the Ned show because he's on the cover, but oh boy, is it the Ned show. Oh man. <laughs> Ned haters, y'all might just want to skip this one because it's, it's, it's yeah. tough. <laughs> uh, yeah. Although he does get kidnapped in this, um, which is excellent. Um, he, the way it's resolved is dumb, but it, yeah. <laughs> it was a fun little moment of Ned being missing. <laughs> For a brief moment where there was hope that he would never come back. <laughs> oh, oh, that's sh- terrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's too funny. Um, do we want to talk about the cover art at all? Yeah, it's Ned and a stingray. That's all you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the only version of it, really. Um, yeah, I of think the so. American version, of course. There are, um, there are other international versions. International, of course. Right. Right, but yeah, this is the Rudy Nappy one with the skulls and the stingray, Ned looking like a dope, and Nancy looking super freaky yeah. um, out <laughs> with her eyes. Um, yeah, and like, what a, I mean, what a promising cover, I mean, to be honest, like, if you just cover up Ned's face, you're like, yeah. oh my god, skulls <laughs> and a stingray? Like, what is that about? Yeah. Um, literally not about the skulls or the stingray at all. Um, not important, not relevant. They're just in a room where those things are at one point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, which again, we spend like maybe half a chapter here. This is clearly a scene from our mm-hmm. fifth location. It's a chimney with a you know over the mantelpiece, the stingray and the skulls are kind of displayed. It's and then just they look annoying spooked. because yeah. they're promised so much spookiness. We really yeah. are, and then it's just like at every turn, it's like no, not spooky, no, not spooky. Oh, kind of spooky skulls, skulls. Oh, we're not okay. Never mind. Not actually, no. <laughs> and dinosaur skeletons. Yeah. Oh God, maybe we should have made that one of the three words. <laughs> man, oh man, that when In I iron heard cages. that. <laughs> Wild. Oh my goodness. Let's get into it because, good yes. lord, do we have a lot to say. Okay, so the book starts off, and Nancy, Bess George, Ned Burton, Dave have all been invited by Helen Corning Archer, now Archer because she's married to Jim Archer, to go on this ghost hunt thing. Um, I don't know whose idea this was. I mean, I do know it was Helen's idea. Weird, weird. I think Um, this is her last appearance, possibly. I'm not sure, but I feel like... I mean, it is very late, so you would think maybe... We haven't seen her in a long time, um, and I don't know if we see her again in the original 56, but um, yeah, maybe this plan of hers was so terrible that they're like, maybe we should stop hanging out with Helen. (laughs) Maybe we shouldn't hang out with Helen. Um, Nancy also has to, like, get permission from Carson to go as well, which I feel like is interesting for a book this late. Um, I feel like we'd kind of dropped that at this point because Nancy's been on so many adventures, but I guess not. Um, and so then she goes to call Helen to like accept her invitation. And she also invites basically everybody over to her house to like talk about and plan the trip. Um, 
And then just like a few minutes after that call that she makes to Helen, she gets a telephone call. Nancy gets a telephone call from a man's voice saying, Nancy Drew, I'm warning you. Beware of the dead. Forget the ghost hunt. Oh. Okay. <laughs> and it's also like, it's a very, a very stereotypical start to a Nancy Drew book. She yeah. has like this unrelated plan that has nothing to do with the mystery, like at all. And then she gets a warning telephone call. And then suddenly it's mysterious because somebody has warned her not to do this seemingly benign thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and also though, in this book though, they don't treat that with like any importance at all. It's like, Nancy just doesn't even really we don't even really talk about it they only say she the the narration only says like afterwards that she like told the other people about it and they seemed concerned yeah and then that was it that's all we hear about that telephone call like there's no like investigation of it there's no sense of like who could possibly this be and why how did they know and there there's none of that there was no moment where Nancy's like maybe somebody was listening in on my phone call there was none of that yeah, we None find out that. later when, like, the bad guy tells her what happened, but she doesn't even be like, oh, how did you, you know, find ask. out? And, like, <laughs> yeah, it's not her looking into it at all. The, so, as much of uh, getting the warning telephone call or the warning note at the beginning of the book is a trope, it's just as much of a trope that Nancy immediately ignores that and then just <laughs> continues doing it anyway. So <laughs> True. Gotta uh, love it. <laughs> so after that, everybody comes over to Nancy's house. Um uh, where Helen basically tells them their trip itinerary for this ghost hunt. Um, first, they're going to go to Pine Grove Camp, which is on Lake Seven E, where there is apparently, wait for it, a haunted canoe that rows itself across the lake. So spooky, so That's scary, Scooby-Doo. you guys. <laughs> Um, the next one is a quote unquote medium's prophecy tent. I don't know what that is. Um, a tent where medium works weird, sure. um, where participants of like her seances hear thunder from inside the tent. That doesn't feel like that big of a mystery. <laughs> also when they eventually go there, I mean, we're going to talk about this. I don't even know why I'm saying this, but like when they eventually go there, they literally don't investigate that at all. Yeah. Not at all. There's, they don't, it's just, anyway, we'll know. have to talk about that. I feel like if, um, if, if it's not currently raining or thundering outside, you can conclude, oh, she's got, like, a sound system set up. A speaker. Up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and she just has this as part of the, part of the experience of the seance. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's one of the two. So... <laughs> Um, then they're going to go to this place called the Red Barn Guest House, where they're supposedly have seen a phantom horse with a rider, like ghost rider, like running after it. Okay. That one's verging on interesting. Verging yeah. on it. Um, but only because there's a horse involved. <laughs> yes. Um, and then number four is like this mountaintop in it's unnamed that used to be a fort um, and where the ghosts of its prisoners allegedly still haunt. Okay, boring. And then five is the home of a skull and shell collector where every night there's been an invisible intruder. This is what Helen says. We don't okay. talk about that when we get there at all. Nope. We don't... Um, oh, it's just so disappointing. They set us up for so much... Um, and then it's just not, you just don't get anything juicy from it. The only exciting things about this for me are the camp because I love a spooky camp vibe. Oh yes. Absolutely. And honestly, they do a good job at the camp. I feel like the camp is a good location. Um, that one's the most fleshed out. I feel like that may be the red barn. The red barn guest house is good too. I think yep. that there's a lot of promise in that that they don't really deliver on, but I, that wets my whistle. You know, I'm excited about that. And then well, the, they're too busy dealing with the Ned kidnapping to really focus true. on that anyway. So, and then the the skull and shell collector home where there's an invisible intruder. I'm like, yeah, let's go there. Let's investigate yeah. that. Let's sure. clearly that's the mystery here. None of the rest of these places like that's what <laughs> we're supposed to be looking at. But we just don't. We just don't get to do that. It's the title of the book, and we don't look into it. It's so annoying. Anyway. 
so they talk about about that or whatever and then the next uh, that started that next week, they start their trip. Um, Nancy, this is when Nancy meets the other couples who are going to be joining them on this trip, who are Bab and Don Hackett. <laughs> I love these names. Bab and Don yes. Hackett, Rita and Rod Rodriguez, and Anne and Bill Blanchard. Um, and so they just immediately start out for Lake 7E. Um, and when they get there, they just go swimming, like, right away. They're just, like, in full camp mode. There's not even a moment of, like, hey, where's the mystery? Let's investigate. It's like, oh, we're at camp. Let's go swimming. Great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, immediately right off the bat, like, as they're swimming, it's full daytime or whatever. They just see the haunted canoe just paddling across the lake. And when I read this – it for sure, in the first chapter, I was like, okay, well, this is just a fake out. Like, this is not the, haunt the haunted canoe. It's just, they're going to get up to the canoe and see that there's actually somebody inside of it. And they're like, no, this is not, this is not the haunted canoe. No, it's the, it's just the haunted canoe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just see it. And so they just, like, immediately, like, swim over to it. Um, they kind of investigate it a little bit, but there's no one in the canoe. And they swim under. There's no one under the canoe, like pulling it along or anything. Um, but they do see that the two oars are just seemingly rowing independently this canoe across the lake. <laughs> Wild. Um, Ned has this grand idea to go get a motorboat and follow it. Um, but by the time that they're able to get the motorboat like out onto the lake, the canoe has disappeared. Of course. Shocking. Um, at dinner that night, they kind of discuss the effects of this haunted canoe on the camp because apparently this canoe, because of this haunting, campers haven't been wanting to come to the camp. And so the owner is considering selling because his business isn't doing as well. Um, later after dinner, they're talking and making these bad jokes. <laughs> In the lobby by the fireplace when a sudden gust of wind opens the door and scatters papers from, like, the desk into the fire and they, like, catch fire and everybody has to, like, stamp out the sparks from this. But then Nancy realizes, she, like, looks outside and she realizes that, like, there's actually no wind outside. And so she doesn't know, like, how the doors blew open. And so she goes outside to like look and then she sees this tall man just like running through the trees. And so she calls out to Ned and they go after this guy and chase him. Um, but he gets away. And then she also realizes that that guy was carrying something like large. And so they look around and they find that he's dropped it. And it's actually a large bellows like... I don't know another word to describe this for people who don't know what bellows are, but like, it's like this thing that you can just like push air through. They use it in like metal work. Right. Um, <laughs> and so the fireplaces too, right. To, to get the sure. fire going and everything. Yeah. This is such a sinister bad guy. He used some bellows to create his wind. <laughs> he blew open the doors. Such oh an evil my man. God. <laughs> oh. Why haven't we called the police already? Um, and so they're just kind of, they're not spooked by this at all. Once they realize that this guy's clearly just like blown these doors open with these bellows that they're just like irritated and they just go to bed because <laughs> they're just like, Oh, what a creep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. But then this is the most interesting part of the book for me, honestly. Um, Nancy wakes up at 2 a.m to the sound of two people like whispering outside. And so she gets up to go investigate. But as soon as she steps outside, she hears like this sing song voice repeating, go stone 70 lake, go away while there's still time. <laughs> Just like oh. over and over again. <laughs> and so Nancy looks around, she doesn't see anybody out there, but then suddenly she sees this ghostly figure of a woman in white, float out of the woods um and then nancy's like internally debating whether or not she should actually like approach this ghost but meanwhile bess inside the cabin wakes up realizes nancy's missing so she gets up to go look for nancy then she sees the ghost lady from the woods outside the window and screams of course because she sees a ghost um and this wakes everybody up from like all of the adjacent cabins and they all come running over here and by the time they get to Bess, the ghostly woman 
has disappeared. Mm. <laughs> um, Dave asks if Bess is sure she didn't just have a nightmare um, uh. in a classic um, gaslighting move. <laughs> um, I guess it's not really gaslighting because he didn't, he doesn't actually know that the ghosts existed, but patronizing nonetheless. Um, Nancy, of course, hearing all this commotion, comes back into the cabin and explains, you know, what she had just heard and what she saw and comforts Bess. And she tells Bess she thinks somebody's just playing a joke on them. Bess doesn't need to be scared. Um, so they decide to search the woods. Um, and indeed, they find this swath of, like, chiffon fabric that looks like what the ghost was wearing. Um, and they bring it inside. And inside of the this, like, bundle of fabric, they find a balloon in the shape of a woman. And then Bert and Dave have to say some weird stuff. Yes, about how, like, uh-huh. they would take it on a date or something. Uh-huh. 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 How uh-huh. it's like a sex doll. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Weird. Uh-huh. Uh, um, uh. by this point um, the camp owner shows up because of all the commotion or whatever and Nancy shows him the balloon and then there's apparently like the name of someone written on the foot of this balloon and so the owner says that this is probably referring to a nearby novelty store that's owned by that person um, but at this point they notice that Ned and Bert are missing from their group Um, but then like, as soon as they notice they're missing, they come back. So whatever they explain that while everyone was looking for the ghost, that they saw some like lights in the woods. And so they like ran after it and found two people with flashlights and bushy hair racing through the woods. Um, and then, but they got away and, oh yeah, they canoed across the lake. That's how they got away. (laughs) Yeah. I just don't think, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like a real classic villain getaway. It seems kind of slow. Have you ever canoed? Like, I mean, once you, once you can, you can get up to a good speed, but it takes you a little bit. And so I just can't imagine that like, you know, Dave and Ned or whatever, just, or Bert and Ned or whatever are running through the forest and chasing after these people. And then they hop in a canoe and are able to get, away from them before that they yeah. can catch up because it just seems like if they were really trying to catch them they could literally just like jump after them in the canoe and yeah. they just wade into the water like a few feet and right catch up. yeah <laughs> but okay whatever um so yeah the next morning they all go to this novelty shop where the proprietor says that he did indeed sell a box of shaped balloons um, like assorted shapes. So, right, it's not just the one. He sold a lot to a couple who stopped by. Apparently, both of uh, those individuals had bushy hair as well. Um, he didn't think that this couple lived near here and thought that they must be vacationers. And he suggests that the group go talk to a nearby real estate agent about them because the real estate agent might know, like, where they're staying. Um But before they leave, he does mention that the woman seemed afraid of the man. I thought this was so interesting. We need to talk about this later, too, because this doesn't ever come up again. Anyway, um, so they go to the real estate agent's office. Um, and the real estate agent is very helpful and actually knows the couple by name. She says they are Wilbur and Beatrice Prizer, um, at their rent and that they're renting a nearby cabin with them and their eight children. Um, uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and she says that when actually when they came to her and rented the cabin, cause I guess they rented the cabin directly from her didn't know you could do that but okay um they asked if pine grove camp was for sale um and when she told them no it wasn't for sale the man said we'll see about that why not just confess to the crime right now honestly (laughs) why would you make that remark that's so so obvious what you're doing oh my gosh like how what a simple to solve crime we find a ghost in the woods. Okay, there's a balloon. We find the actual ghost. There's a balloon. What we can clearly see on the balloon where it's from. So we go to the place where it's from. The guy's like, "Yeah, I sold that balloon to these people." 
um, I don't know their names. Oh, this lady might know their names. They go to, yeah, I know their names. They're, they're these people. And they said this weird thing about, you know, the camp and that we'll see about that. <laughs> it's like, well, how clearly obvious. they're trying to scare people away from the camp so they can buy it. This is chapter clearly. three. Chapter three, we learned this. In chapter three, we've solved the whole thing. We've solved yeah. the whole thing in chapter three. Mm-hmm. And now we're just going to go from place to place, hoping that the bad guys show up there so we can track them down. Yeah. Anyway. So at this point, Nancy and her her group go to try to track down this cabin. Um, they do find it eventually, but it's very secluded. They knock, and this older gentleman answers and invites him in. Um, and he explains that Wilbur is actually his son. Um, so the elder Mr. Prizer starts explaining to them that they rented this cabin for him, his son and daughter-in-law for the summer. And Nancy's like, oh, do you come a lot here because of the children? And he's like, no, the, my son doesn't have any kids. All right. So, uh, so much for those eight children and the birthday party with the balloons. But apparently they have a lot of real estate holdings. And so they are really busy traveling around a lot. So Wilbur Prizer and his wife are not here because they're doing real estate things. Whatever. <laughs> um, but the, the older the older man starts telling us that he has this um, collection of books and shells. He loves collecting shells, so he starts showing us um, some of his collection. Um, Bab, from one of the married couples that are joining us on this trip, she knows a lot about shells. Oh, yeah. um, she notices that there is an octopus shell on the mantle and starts asking him about it. And he starts talking about octopi and how they reproduce and have multiple hearts and they're incredibly intelligent. We just get this whole octopus <laughs> lesson. Um, but then he just like stands up and like motions for the door. Like Nancy just takes his cue like, oh, I guess he wants us to leave now. So they all go. Um, they go back to the camp and George starts asking Rita about her beliefs with ghosts because Rita had previously mentioned that she believes in ghosts and the supernatural. Um, Rita apparently has ESP, though, and George starts asking her to make a prediction about this, you know, this case and this trip that they're they're coming on. Rita obliges and says that she has this vision of a young couple getting into a boating accident. Um and so upon hearing this, Nancy goes, oh, that's weird. Um, anyway, anybody want to go take the canoe out? Um, <laughs> Ned, are you down to go in the canoe? Oh, my God. This is, okay, this is crazy to me. I'm sorry, I cannot move forward without talking about this a little bit. Essentially, they're making fun of Rita. Like, yeah. George is essentially oh, yeah. using Rita just purely for entertainment. And then they just, like, completely move on, right? Because they don't believe her at all. And... And then she's, like, proved right. Of course. Yeah. We're going to see that in a second. Oh, they immediately have a boating accident. And seconds then, later. Yeah. But then we just, like, continue to disbelieve Rita. Like, we never yeah. we never circle back and think that, like, oh, Rita was actually, she actually does have ESP. Even though she clearly does. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Anyway, sorry. No, this scene Noise made me so mad mind. because, no, they, they are really, they're only, they're egging each other on. George only asks about this because they're trying to make fun of her. And when she starts talking about this, it's like uproarious laughter mm -hmm. from everyone else. They're all, they all think it's absolutely hilarious. Um, and then even Rod, her husband, like, comes over and is like, oh, they're there. Let's go. Let's, you know get you back inside or whatever oh, so you really? can go be alone. Because, I remember there's a moment like that later. It's not quite like that, but it's very dismissive. And um, Oh, I thought I thought it was at this point. Maybe I'm confusing it with something that happens later. But I don't yeah, yeah I don't no, remember. at this scene, he's not comforting her that like, oh, I'm sorry that everyone made fun of you. He's comforting her like I know that you know that you embarrassed me just now talking about your ESP, but I'm you know, I forgive you, so it's okay. I don't remember that, but that it just came off as very patronizing to me. Def I mean, there's there's definitely a moment later at the uh, I think I want to say it's at the guest house or whatever where Rita says something and he just like shuts it, might have it been that shuts it said. down. Um, For some even reason, that, though, I thought it was here, but wasn't that bad. But now I want to look at it now. Hold on. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. It's right after they actually have the boating accident. So she oh, makes the prediction of the boating accident. Yeah. They go. They have the accident. She gets upset. And then, of course. Because they're talking about 
the bad guys trying to get rid of them. And she's like, Uh we have no proof that it was people trying to get rid of us. I'm sure the canoe incident was supernatural. Her husband laughs at her. Honey, this moonlight has got to you. He turned to the others. Forgive me, but I can't go along with Rita and her belief in ghosts. And then to make amends... He puts his arm around his wife. Let's go back and forget the whole thing. So he's he's not apologizing for embarrassing her. He's saying, it's okay that you embarrassed me, Jessica. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh-huh. what he's saying. Uh-huh. Of like, don't you talk about this in front of other people, especially people we don't know that well. This is horrible. <laughs> I hate Rod. I hate Rod so much. <sighs> and everyone who joins in with making fun of Rita about Which it. Which is everybody. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. So, Yeah, so Nancy and Ned take the canoe out, and then while they're out, they see the phantom canoe. Um, So they start chasing it, of course, Um, but then it kind of goes into this cove, and Nancy and Ned are like, oh, perfect, we can kind of like trap it in there, and then there won't be a way for it to get out, because it got away from us last time. Um, So they get over to the cove, and then they're like paddling as hard as they can, but their boat's like not moving. Like, they're trying to move forward, but it feels like maybe there's, like, a current or something weird. They're rowing rowing really hard, but it's just not going anywhere. And then suddenly their canoe just tips over and knocks both of them into the water. Uh, so Nancy comes up from the water, and she looks around, and, of course, Ned does not come up to the surface. So she dives back down and sees that an octopus is dragging him away. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> So Nancy tries to like swim down to rescue him. Um, and she's like, she's kind of weird. She kind of deba- debates whether she should even like try to like kick the octopus off of Ned. Cause she's like, if I do that, it might yeah. come from me instead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the octopus does let go of Ned. Nancy's able to get him to shore. He's totally fine. But then he starts explaining what happened on his end. Um, he apparently he's just like grabbed just by being it and grabbed by underneath. it underneath. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so obviously this is just a lake. Octopus don't live in lakes. They're not native to this. So they figure either somebody has like got this octopus from somewhere <laughs> else and then relocated it here, um, or someone is just wearing an octopus costume. <laughs> That's all, the obvious other solution. <laughs> um. Yeah, so they they look around. The canoe is gone, so they end up having to, like, swim to the shore and then walk around the lake back to camp. Uh, But once they get back, they investigate the other canoes. I guess they just, like, have a line of them ready to go up by the the shore. Um, And they find that in each one of these canoes is a remote control device. Um, So they figure the bad guys obviously have installed these on all of the canoes, including the ghost canoe. And that's how the ghost canoe is operating just on its own on the water. But then that's also how Nancy and Ned were able to not continue rowing forward because someone was actively holding them back by remote control. Okay. I have to raise my hand here because this does not make sense. No, it doesn't. If you have ever, ever in your moment spent, ever in your life spent one moment in a canoe, the paddles aren't connected. This is not a yeah. rowboat. The paddles exist outside of the canoe and, and disconnected completely. A remote control device on the bottom of a canoe that you don't see until you investigate every canoe is not going to be able to independently row oars. No, you'd need, like, robotic arms to be doing that. And you would notice that. And it would be connected to the boat, and you would see that. Right. So, it doesn't make sense. Not at all. (laughs) Not even a little bit. Anyway, sorry. Continue. Uh, (sighs) Yeah, so they figure out that this is... This is obviously how the bad guys have been doing this. Um, So Bert and Dave decide to take a motorboat out to look for the the canoe that Nancy and Ned had lost. And then also look for the phantom canoe while they're out as well. Um, And then everybody else goes to speak to the owner of the camp. The owner is absolutely done with all this. Um, He says he's just about to the point where he is ready to sell. But Nancy's like, no, no, no. Promise me you won't sell just yet. I think I'm on the verge of cracking this case. Just wait a little bit for me to see if I can't you know, catch the bad guys, find a solution here. Um, and it's good that she says this because right away he gets a call from Mr. Prizer, who is trying to buy this place from him. Um, so of course, Mr. Prizer is like awful and mean on the phone and you know, the owner tells him no. So he like is a jerk and cusses him out. And then that's the end of the phone call. Uh, but then at this time, Bert and Dave get back and they have found a fake octopus, like rubber octopus doll in the lake. And it's got a motor on it. 
So it's not even anybody in a costume. It's just another motorized thing. That doesn't make any sense. How did yeah. it grab onto Ned? I think, uh, so they like imply too that it's not, that it's like that and somebody dressing up as an octopus. That it's like underwater. Oh. Someone grabbed Ned and was holding Ned and, and actually dragging him or whatever. While there was also just that octopus robot down there too. And Nancy sees the octopus and assumes that it's the octopus and doesn't see the man clearly under there who's swimming and holding Ned down. I'm so tired. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's so convoluted. Why? Why Why have an octopus at all? What's the point? What's the point of the motor if you also have the man physically moving it? And, like, why? You already knocked them out of the canoe. Like, you're fine. You don't need to just, I mean, it would have made more sense to me if if something weird happened with their canoe, they couldn't paddle it. The canoe gets capsized or whatever. And then when they go under and look, they see an octopus swimming away. And really that's just a man in a costume because it makes sense that if they were just underwater, that a man is just standing there holding the canoe so that they can't move forward. That makes sense. But no, that's actually, there's actually a robotic device on the bottom of the canoe that does that, that stops it from moving first of all how 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 is a robotic device on the bottom of a, can of a canoe gonna stop someone from being able to physically paddle the canoe in the water it would no. have to have a motor that goes in the opposite direction and how is it gonna know what direction you're paddling the canoe Unless someone is watching you and, and watching you paddle and is controlling the motor, it would have to have a propeller on it. This is 69. It's not, this, there's no magic. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, this is so fantastical because this technology did not exist in the 60s. It doesn't it's too exist sophisticated. today. Even for now, yeah. <laughs> Does it make any sense? I'm sorry. Either I, the machine that would have to be working this would be so large and obvious that you would notice right away that that's how it's working, or like you wouldn't be able to put it into the water without noticing that it has. Oh right. yeah, there's a motor and a propeller on the bottom of this. Uh huh. Or it's so small that it actually wouldn't have the visual effect. Like you would never think, oh, that's rowing on its own because it wouldn't have the capability to move the oars. Or it would be so obvious that you would know right away. Also, Sorry. I don't know what kind of tech genius this is or whatever, but he put a remote control device on the bottom of the canoe under water and this robotic uh, octopi or whatever works underwater? Independently? I guess it could be battery operated and so could be inside something completely waterproof, but that just seems... You're putting Dangerous. your electronics in the water and yeah, just that hoping that it, it works. That's wild. <laughs> How rich are these people that they're doing all this scaring just to, you know, get a cheaper deal on buying this land or these buildings or whatever? Gotta but be they real can rich. spend all this equipment for motorized boat equipment and yeah it's like crime. clearly you i don't understand the motive for the crime like i get like real estate gets you money and so you're trying to buy places on the cheap so that you can sell them for more i understand how real estate works but it doesn't seem like you should be desperate for money if you're a literal genius and can make these things like you could just yeah. get a job like as an engineer or and Why? you have all five of these places? And they're all so varied. Are they just close together and that's why geographically you want them? It's not like the structures on them are, you know, like this is a house, this is a summer camp. Like it's not like those are similar buildings that you're, unless you're going to that down to build housing or something. Right. Also, this is not the only crime. Like they're no. also, we'll, we'll get to it, but they're also doing another crime, which is inc much more lucrative than this and so much less effort than all of this. So, this is so bizarre. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> so it's a motorized octop octopus, whatever. Um, 
So Nancy obviously has solved it by now. So she's like, let's go visit the elder and Mr. Prizer again. Go back over to that cabin. They get there and the place has been cleared out. They're gone. They've skipped town. Um, but the realtor that they met the other day shows up pretty much right when they arrive as well. And she is not happy. Um, she tells them that the Prizers left town and left her a phony check. So Ooh. great. Didn't um, pay. She also... <laughs> It's just like so funny that it's like they've all this done all this crime or whatever, and it's like they just it's just funny oh, to me. Pay. Sorry, I misheard you. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and now now you have check fraud as well. Like, right. great, just add that to the list up. of crimes. Stack it up. It's like, yeah, it's giving out on a bill. It's like you just you made a motorized octopus to pretend that there is a, a self propelling haunted canoe going across the lake. But really, the crime is just that you just didn't pay for your rental. Like, <laughs> they got. Oh my god! Genius criminals, <laughs> so smart. Uh, but the realtor also tells them that she believes that the shell collection that they had was primarily stolen stuff. Um, she, they go into the house to investigate a little bit, and they even find an article there that describes the theft of a collection of shells from this like famous collector guy. So they left, like, evidence of their crimes <laughs> in the house where they were staying. Oh, my God. Um, but then they're like, hey, Ned, you should go up in the attic and see if they left anything up there. So he goes, and he finds the phantom canoe up there. And he's like, don't worry, guys, I'll bring it down the little, like, <laughs> attic ladder or whatever. And in the process of doing this, crashes through the ceiling with the canoe. This is like an SNL skit. This is yeah. like you can make yeah. such an excellent parody of this book with really Ned could. just like breaking through walls and stuff. <laughs> uh, but Ned's fine, and they're able to find the motors in the canoe that make the oars move, and so they call the police, and the police come and get everything. Great. Um, of course, the prizers are not caught because they're already gone by this point, but they tell the owner of the camp about them solving this, and he's thrilled because it means he doesn't have to sell the camp now. Alrighty, now it's time to head to destination number two in a town called Vernonville, where the medium works. Um, they check into a motel nearby, and they're informed that the medium is holding a seance tonight. Um, it's a women-only seance. How convenient. We don't have to invite the guys. Um, but before the seance, she's also holding individual consultations, um, you know, for just like one-on-ones beforehand. So the girls go and they decide that they're all going to try to get like an individual consultation beforehand. And then they're all going to go to the seance together, uh, afterwards. Um, so they get there and they meet the medium. Her name is Madame Tarantella. And she says that she'll speak to Nancy first. So she takes Nancy back into her back room and she starts to give Nancy like a normal, but very incredibly accurate reading about herself. Um, and then she gets up and like, as Nancy's getting up, the medium like grabs Nancy's arm and says, you are in my power and you must help me. What? Okay. So Bess and George have to like run in and like rescue her from the literal clutches of this woman. Um, and the woman starts explaining that, no, 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 that wasn't me. I was in a trance just now. It was a <laughs> ghost that grabbed Nancy's arm. Um, I had a premonition actually that men are going to come and attack me because I have all these important papers. And she's like, Nancy, I need you to take the papers with you so that the men won't come and harm me and take the papers away. And Nancy's like, oh, yeah, no, obviously I'm not doing that. Why would I do that for you? Um, but <laughs> the medium is so spooky in her manner that this, like, really upsets Bess and Bess gets freaked out and wants to leave. But the seance is about to start, so Nancy convinces her to stick around. In the seance, a voice, like, comes through the medium's voice and uh, claims to be this man who used to, to work at the marriage license office uh, or the marriage marriage license bureau in River Heights and tells Bess that you're going to be visiting the marriage license bureau soon because you're going to be getting your own marriage license before too long. Oh my and God. Bess is like, no, 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 no. Dave has to finish college first. Like, this can't be real. This is too spooky. Get me out of here. Um, so they... <laughs> So this is when leave. they're like, okay, we'll leave. We'll leave now. The, the thought yeah. of marriage is too scary. We've got to it's get out so, of here. <laughs> so frightening. Honestly, this is accurate, though, especially when you look at all the married friends who are around here. Yeah. I wouldn't want to get into that either, Bess. 
yeah, no thank you. <laughs> oh man. Okay. So um they leave, but they're heading towards the door and they start to hear the thunder. The thunder that's rumored to be haunting, because everyone knows thunder haunts medium <laughs> huts all the time. Um, <laughs> but they go outside and like it's just actually storming right now. So mystery solved the thunder came from the thunderstorm there's just a Um, lot of storms in the place there's just it's a stormy area like yeah that's it (laughs) um so they're like yeah i better hurry to the car because it's lightning (sighs) george gets struck by lightning (laughs) walking back to the car oh man but she's totally fine um but then they get to the car and nancy's like oh this is so weird my car is locked i never <laughs> That's the locked weird my part. car weird part is that your friend just got s- struck by lightning or the fact that this weird lady inside told you that you had to take her papers no the weird part is that you thought you locked your car and it's locked. <laughs> oh my god uh yeah um <laughs> who wrote this is this harriet i don't know Harriet, we gotta have some words, babe. <laughs> yeah, this was Harriet, I believe. <laughs> um, so George, George gets struck by lightning, but she's fine. And then they get in the car and they drive home. But when they get home, um, Bess like reaches into the back seat to grab her sweater because she just kind of thrown it in the back when they got in the car. But under the sweater, she finds that there's a large box in the car that wasn't there before. And Nancy's like, "Don't touch it! Don't touch it! It's probably a bomb." Oh my god. Why? 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 <laughs> Why do we have this thought? Where does that come from? Who's trying to bomb us? Why would there be a bomb in the back of your car, Nancy? It's a bomber on the loose. That's the real mystery. It's definitely not a bomb. And it's probably a bomb though. It's probably. definitely not. It's definitely not. And <laughs> The girls even have, they, they're at the the motel or wherever they're at, and they find, like, a rake to open the box with because they think there's a bomb. Because using a long-handled rake is definitely going to be far enough away from this box if it is an explosive device. You'll be totally fine if it's just, like, you know, three feet away from you. <laughs> you yeah. won't get hurt then. <laughs> um, but they open it. It's not a bomb. It's actually just a box of papers. Oh, you mean like the box that the woman, the medium, asked you to take for her? Yes. This is Madame Tarantella's box of papers. She must have just put it in Nancy's car at some point. Wow, what a revolution. Um, So the next morning, uh, Nancy decides to call Carson and ask for his advice on what to do with this box of papers. He tells her that she needs to return them. So she... Great advice, Carson. She gets a group of people to go back to the medium's place with her. But once they get there, it's empty. It's gone. It has been cleared out. Surprise, surprise. Um, And a neighbor comes over and tells them that in the middle of the night, two trucks drove up, loaded up everything, and uh, two men escorted Madame Tarantella out, and they all left. Um, and Nancy asks what they looked like, and this neighbor says that one was a tall man with bushy hair. So, this is Mr. Prizer. Yeah, that's... Obviously. That, yeah. Right. Um, so, Nancy calls Carson again, and she's like, I tried, but... <laughs> and Carson tells her he's going to send over a lawyer friend of his to take the papers from Nancy. The lawyer is going to hold on to the papers. So, Nancy is waiting at the hotel room, at the hotel for him, Um, and at this point, because she's like waiting alone, Helen comes over to her room, I guess, to just hang out or something, um, and accidentally knocks this box of papers to the ground (laughs) and they all spill out. I just think, okay, no, how much do we want to bet that this was not an accident? Because here's my thing. Nancy herself, If this was any other book, Nancy would immediately be crawling through that box of papers, reading every single one. But I just imagine if I were a friend of Nancy's and we have this incredibly mysterious medium or whatever, and she has this premonition of men coming to attack her and wants you to take this box of papers and you end up with a box of papers and you're not looking through it, I would be like, 
dude, look in the box. And so I bet you anything that Helen comes in here and is like, oh, whoopsie daisy, I knocked it everywhere. <laughs> oh no, now we have to read them and pick them up. <laughs> so yeah, that's what they do. Um, as they're picking them up, they gather them and they happen to see a few different documents. One is a drawing of a property development. Um, random, completely unimportant. It does not matter. We won't learn anything about that ever again. A letter from Mr. Prizer. And <laughs> this is the best. I love this so much. A telegram that just says rare, period, medium, period. Well done. <laughs> So clever, so mm. clever. So Nancy explains that she thinks that this is just a sophisticated, very sophisticated code that's just praising Madame Tarantella for doing a rare job well. And she, because Helen is like, oh, this is, sounds like a burger order. Um, uh -huh. And Nancy's like, no, it's clearly this code. Obviously it means this. I remember, I remember being like 10 years old and reading this book and being like, this is this is BS. This, this is, is so the stupid. stupidest thing I've ever read. <laughs> Even as a 10 year old, that didn't no fly way. with me. So reading it now, I was like, really? Come on. Good gravy. Um, all right. So, but this clearly means that Madame Tarantella is involved with Mr. Prizer somehow um, with the letter. And she seems to be doing jobs that people have to write in code about. Okay. So, Whatever. So Nancy goes to fix her hair in the mirror. Um, and as she does that, she sees a hand reaching through the open doorway, um, which way to go, Helen, for leaving the door open when you came in, trying to grab this box of papers just like sneakily and just like yoink them out of this room or whatever. So <laughs> Nancy runs over um, and grabs the arm. But, of course, yanks away. Um, and so then Nancy just, like, runs out to the corridor after it. Turns out it's just this guy. He's just running away. So she goes to chase him. And then she runs past uh, Dave, Bert, and Ned. And they all run after this guy. Um, but, of course, he gets away. That should have been one of the three words. Bad guys getting away. Because they just run off so fast. What are these guys fucking track stars or something? <laughs> Sorry. Truly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yikes. Um, but Ned does think that when he was running, he thought that he had bushy hair. Great. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> um, afterwards, um, Carson's lawyer friend shows up, takes the box of papers away. And then Nancy and Helen decide to go to the pool. Um, but when they, like, open the door to Nancy's room to go back into Nancy's room to get, like, their swimsuits on or whatever, they see a ghostly apparition. Oh, no, sorry. They open the door into the hallway from Nancy's room to go to the pool. They see this ghostly apparition. <gasps> so scary. <laughs> At a shock, Helen just shuts the door. So she opens it, sees the ghost, ah, closes the door. That's a normal reaction, I feel like. That's great. I love Helen so much in this, actually. Um... And then she realizes, like, oh, I'm being silly. Why did I just shut the door? Like, it's ghost. It's not going to hurt me. So she opens it again. And then um, it's, like, dissipating. It's, like, literally, like, fog, like, dissipating in the hallway. Um, like, it's some kind of, like, gas or something. Mm. Um, and so Nancy, like, calls the front desk to, like, alert the hotel that, like, hey, there's, like, some kind of weird gas in the hallway um, that we can see, and that might be dangerous for hotel guests or whatever. And then she also suspects that this is some kind of ploy by Prizer to scare them and get them to leave the room so that he could collect the papers, which, of course, are no longer there, but he doesn't know that. Great. Okay. All right, so somehow he had time to come over there, try to just yoink the papers out of your room, run away, then make it back literally like five minutes later, rig a gas effect to look like a person so that he could set it off to get you to leave so that yeah, he could easy. come back. Also, this means that he would be still there hanging around, but we don't look for him. We just go to the pool. Oh, yeah. These people are dumb. Excellent. Yeah. Um, but so Helen goes to change into her swimsuit in her room, and Nancy's still in her room. And then she, Nancy gets a call from a woman 
who is not Madame Tarantella, but she says that she has a message for Nancy from the spirit world. And eventually tells Nancy that this message is from Nancy's grandfather, who says that she needs to leave this box of papers under a bridge just outside of town, and that if she doesn't, she'll be punished. How stupid do they think Nancy is? Well, listen, I mean, they can't be that wrong because... True. Basically, after Nancy gets this phone call, she tells everyone about it, and they decide that Nancy should take a fake box of papers and leave it there under this bridge. Um, This is just wild to me. Because, of course, it's like, okay, well, they're worried that if they don't, then the bad guys will continue to come after Nancy, which is fair. I think that's a fair thing. But the thing is, is like, she doesn't have these papers anymore. So you don't think that when she leaves this fake box of papers that then the bad guys are going to continue coming after her? And that if maybe, even if she goes to this location, that maybe that's not safe because that's a location where the bad guys have asked her to be? Right. (laughs) It just seems like a terrible plan, through and through. Anyway, um, but so she even called, this is even crazier, she calls the lawyer who has the papers now and asks him to arrange to have the police there at this bridge to arrest anybody who comes for the fake box. Okay. One, why wouldn't you, why can't you call the police yourself, Nancy? Two. Right. (laughs) If you're calling the lawyer who has these papers, maybe just like tell, if you're that worried about these bad guys, like why didn't on the phone, why didn't she be like, oh, actually I don't have them anymore. I gave right. them to a lawyer because they're not my, like, I don't own these papers, so I didn't want right. to keep them. <laughs> like, right. Seems very simple. I don't get it, man. Um, but instead anyway. she's like, wait, how do you know my grandpa, though? Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but so what? that's what they do. They arrange to have this box drop off and Ned and Nancy go to this bridge um, Nancy goes to leave this box she gets scratched by a cat underneath the bridge for no reason um, then a young boy comes up to them while they're underneath this bridge and says that Bert and Dave are down the road and they're asking for Ned so Ned leaves to go find Bert and Dave and Nan- while well, he leaves Nancy under the bridge to leave the box the whole reason he came with Nancy in the first place is because he didn't want Nancy to come here alone. And now he's just bailing on her. Yeah. Tool. What a tool. Um, so she places the box under the bridge and then starts walking out back towards the car when someone comes up behind her and grabs her. It's almost like so, we knew this would happen. <laughs> it's like, Bert and Dave can't wait. You're literally just going to set this box down and go. Like, I know. I can't wait the one second it's going to take for you to do that, Nancy. I have to leave you here alone. Okay. So he seems like he's trying to drown her, um, like, in the water. Like, he's, like, pulling her down to the ground to, like, murder her. And so she's, like, fighting him back, like, hard, like, Yeah. Um, But luckily, the policemen that the lawyer called are there, see this happening, come over and arrest that guy. They're able to, like, take him into custody. Um, And he explains that he has attacked Nancy because a medium called him and said that he had to stop Nancy. Otherwise, something bad would happen to him. So this man is just another victim of their stuff. Right, except he's also apparently insane because yeah. he is thinks that that's justification to attack someone. Right. Also, the medium didn't tell him to attack Nancy. She just told he I'm pretty sure she just told him to stop her. Yeah, and go get the box, right? So So right. So why yeah. did he feel the need to try to drown her? Uh, no. Um Right, so um, he's arrested. Great. Um, um, But Nancy realizes that Ned is still missing. Like, after all this, he still hasn't come back. Um, They go look at Nancy's car. He's not at Nancy's car. Um, But Nancy actually has to go to, like, the police station to take this man to jail with the police and press charges, right? And so when they come back, um, 
she and the police start looking for Ned. Um, they think that they find his footprints um, and follow them to what seems to be an abandoned cabin where the windows are all boarded up. Um, they manage to like pry a board off and like look inside and Nancy sees, this is wild, sees a mannequin or sorry, they don't know that it's a mannequin. She sees a man that looks to be dressed like Ned on the ground. And so she's worried that that's Ned and he's dead on the floor and they break down the door. It's actually kind of sad. Nancy is clearly very worried and upset about it. Um, and, and kind of a little bit in fits about it because Ned is just missing, which I think is just so funny that like Mm -hmm. you've gone out to this location to do this thing and he came with you for protection and he ends up getting kidnapped. Like, Classic peak Ned. comedy. Peak comedy. It's um, like Kennergy, I'm telling you. <laughs> it's true Kennergy. <laughs> um, so they break into this cabin, but it turns out it's not Ned. It's just a mannequin that has some, for some reason, been dressed up like Ned. So is Ned just <gasps> naked with his cadavers <laughs> tied up in the woods? I didn't even think about that. That's so funny. Um, And Nancy starts looking around this cabin and she sees a cloak like the one Madame Tarantella wore. And she also finds a shell that has a card attached to it, which says that it's a crusader's shell. Uh, Okay. It literally doesn't matter. On the inside of the shell, she finds that there are initials MT carved into the shell. And so she thinks that stands for Madame Tarantella, which is hilarious to me. That it's like, do they think Madame Tarantella doesn't have a first name? Like no, her first name she is thinks- Madame, right? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe her first name does start with an M. It's just a coincidence. It's, Who that, knows? That's true. Maybe it's like Mary or something. Like yeah. That. <laughs> that would be funny. Great. Oh, wild. Um, so now they all return to the road, and Dave, Bert, Bess, and George all drive up at this point, and Nancy tells them what has just happened. Um, the police tell them all to go back to the motel and wait for them to investigate or for someone to contact them and kind of give them an update. Um, but Nancy's so worried she can't eat, she just kind of paces by the phone until it finally rings. Um, but it's Ned calling and he's like, Hey, yeah, I was kidnapped, but I got away, but I have a really long story to tell you. Um, it, it's not a long story. He tells it pretty quickly later, but for now he's already at the third location. He just went there instead, um, which is the red barn guest house. So he says, I've already arranged lodgings for everyone here. Just come along. There's something I got to show you basically. Um, so Nancy, (laughs) Oh. Nancy has this thought that's like, oh my gosh, what if he's being like tricked? What if he's saying all this under duress? Um, what if he's still with the kidnappers? Um, but they have this code phrase that they've worked out. Doesn't have one with Carson, I'll say, but she has a code with Ned <laughs> that like if she asks him a question and if he responds with this, it means he's fine. But if he responds with this, it means he's in danger. Well, she confirms that he's fine, so it's real. Um, So they all check out of the hotel, and they head over the next morning. Um, So when they get there, Ned explains that he was kidnapped by two men, but managed to escape because they got a flat tire and then just walked (laughs) to walk to the guest house. So really not, not that heroic of a story, not that long of a story. He just walked here. He just escaped and just managed to walk. So Jeez. while he was waiting for us to arrive, the rest of the group to arrive, he was talking to the owner, um, and he tells us that the owner of the guest house is having occupancy issues just like the summer camp because of the ghost horse and the phantom rider. All right. Surprise, so, surprise! Yes. Um, Mrs. Hodge is her name, is the owner. Um, she's convinced that someone is doing this on purpose to drive business away from her yep. um, guest house. Right. Obviously, that's what's happening. We already know that that's what's happening. Nancy knows that that's what's happening, but we're not going to say anything, right? So um, Ned also tells us that the night before when he was sleeping, he heard screaming coming from the road near the guest house um, as if someone was being beaten with a chain. What? Um, But he didn't see anything, much less a ghost horse or a ghost rider. So he just... You know, left it. Um, but then this as, is never explained. Yeah, they don't. What? Like what? <laughs> it's very dark. Um, but while he's telling telling us all this, there's a crash upstairs. Um, so they all run upstairs, and Mrs. Hodge tells us that a trunk that had been stacked on top of another trunk just fell, 
Like it was stacked in a very sturdy way. It wasn't like teetering on the edge and about to fall or anything. It was just there and then it fell over. Very spooky. Um, <laughs> so they search the attic a little bit and they find the old trunk has um, the one that fell just has some old clothes in it. Um, but then the trunk underneath that is sitting on the top of a on top of a trap door. Um, so mm. it seems like someone just tried to raise the trap door and that's what made the trunk fall obviously. Um, <laughs> but when they go down to the trap door, it leads to a very large bedroom closet. Um, so whoever it was must have gotten away through the closet while everybody else was trying to console Mrs. Hodge. Um, so some of the group goes out to inspect the barn while Nancy looks at the guest book for the, the guest house and sees who all has stayed in this room in the past, who all would have like had access to this. Maybe they were just staying there one night, discovered the trap door, made a note of it and knew that they could come back and, and pull off his haunting stuff. Uh, and who is on the guest list? Mr. And Mrs. Prizer. Go oh. figure. Um, so according to Mrs. Hodge, who remembers them very well, obviously who wouldn't remember the very specifics about every guest that stayed there a year ago, um, apparently they spent most of their time hiking, but they did ask her if she would ever consider selling, to which she said no, which angered them. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> My God. Ned also tells us that he remembers seeing a note in the trunk when he was kidnapped um, that mentioned something about a barn being for sale. Okay. So the prizers obviously are trying to scare her into selling so that they can buy her land for cheap or buy her building for cheap. Great. Um, the rest of the group doesn't find anyone in the barn, but they decide that they should all take shifts that night to see who the phantom rider is and the phantom horse is and what's going on, on with that. Um, so they split up into like shifts or whatever. And Nancy has the like midnight shift and exactly at midnight, what happens <laughs> The horse comes running out, out of the woods, like straight at the barn where they're all kind of hanging out and then just like veers suddenly and then gallops off into the woods again. And then the rider is like following very close behind him. So Ned puts his ear to the ground and notices that there's no like hoof beats or footsteps or anything. They can't find any tracks on the ground for a horse or for a person. So was it really actually a ghost? Very spooky. Um, oh the next morning, though, they decide to go search for clues. Now that it's a little bit lighter outside, and they do find some men's footprints and some horse tracks and a broken bush. This okay, so it was just too dark. irritates <laughs> me to no end. Yeah. Was Ned just wrong? Yeah. And it, because yeah. clearly there's horse tracks, so the horse, there was a horse. Like, yeah. The horse is well, real. we know there was unless, a horse. We saw the Unless horse. someone <laughs> is walking around in those shoes that make it look like horse hooves, you know? <laughs> like, unless that's happening, which, why would you do that if you're trying to portray a phantom horse? Clearly, the, the hoof prints are, are a mistake. You don't want people to see those. So there's a horse. Like, yeah. It's just a, it's just a horse. Uh, it's just a horse. Probably just, covered in phosphorus and powder, and Nancy would know right. that this works from Shadow Ranch. Right. Um, but then George falls into a hole in the ground. Um, Woo! She's fine. Good job. Um, <laughs> this always, is always like inadvertently helping. Like she's yeah. just. She's not helping. She's just, like, inconveniencing everyone. But they do need to find this hole because it's actually a trap that's been set for someone. Um, possibly an attempt to hinder anyone who goes running after the phantom horse, perhaps? Mm. Interesting. Um, so they follow the tracks a little bit further, but they just disappear at the end of the road. Um, so they head back and they investigate the trap a little bit more and they find a small shell on the ground. It also has the initials MT on it. Great. Um, so then they had to go to church with Mrs. Hodge. Um, we get a whole sermon on stealing and Nancy is like, oh, I'm glad I have such a strong moral compass that would prevent me from being such a bad person. But, you know, I hope those bad guys are saying their prayers or whatever. I don't know. But um, they, they get back from church. They spend a long time at church. Um, they get back and they decide to stake out the pit where George fell just in case whoever dropped the shell comes back looking for it. Um, and it turns out it's, like, actually a valuable shell, so the person who would 
have lo- the person who did lo- lose it would have like wanted to come back and find it. So they do. They wait around, and eventually this like well dressed teenage boy shows up and starts poking around, looking around for it. So they all surround him and ask like, "Hey, what you doing? What you doing over here?" <laughs> The boy is, like, immediately on the defensive. He's like, uh, I'm uh, looking for rabbits. But Nancy puts the screws to him, which is just asking some incredibly simple and straightforward questions, and he cracks right away. He admits that a man told him that he'd pay him if he came out here and found this shell for him. Um, He says his name is Steve. And he tells them, oh, actually, that guy who hired me is still waiting in his car on the roadside like right now for me to come back so they decide okay well you go ahead a little bit and we will follow you out to the car um but we're gonna stay out of sight so that we can like surprise this guy who we think is mr prizer um so steve they follow steve and we get to the car and steve approaches it And then he ends up just like getting into the passenger seat and then he shifts over to the driver's seat and drives away uh, Weird. <laughs> now, instead of thinking that Steve has pulled one over on them and uh, is actually a bad guy or whatever, they are worried that that Mr. Prizer was hiding in the car and threatened Steve somehow and forced Steve to get into the car and drive away and whatever. Um, and so they're worried about Steve. Um, they do make a note of the plate number and the make and model of the car. And so they walk down the road to the next house to call the police and tell them about this. Um, after that, they walk back to the guest house. Um, and once they get there, they find that Mrs. Hodge is like super upset. She, um, says that she just returned home after being in town and found that her house, this, uh, guest house has been ransacked um so uh uh-oh uh you know concerning nancy thinks maybe were they after the shell that nancy has maybe they realized that nancy took it um and everything is like strewn about everywhere everything has clearly been turned over right but it doesn't seem like a whole lot was stolen aside from just some cash and jewelry that mrs hodge had Um, But then Mrs. Hodge realizes that, oh, actually, also the deed to the house was stolen. Ooh, uh uh-oh. So they call the police again and report this to the police. Um, And they show up. The police show up to, like, search for clues or whatever. And Nancy is, like, praised by them um, after, like, she turns the shell over to them and basically explains her whole theory about Mr. Prizer and about how Madame Tarantella is probably working with him and they're stealing these shells and haunting these places or whatever. Um, and they're like, Oh my God, Nancy, you're so smart. I can't believe you put this all together. Blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, that's an interesting scene too, because Nancy is like all bashful or whatever about it. And then later says that, made sure to mention that she picked up some tips from the police when they're there too. Like she watches Ugh. them investigate and she's able to, you know, file away some ideas that she can use herself later. <sighs> okay. Pandering to men. That's what this is. Anyway. Um, so the police tell Nancy and them that Steve is still missing. They haven't been able to find Steve. Um, and his mom's actually worried about him. And everyone's worried that he may have come to some harm at the hands of Mr. Price. Or, like, really, he's just a good kid who may have gotten, like, mixed up in some crime, right? Mm. Um, and after this, she decides to give Carson a call, I guess, to just update him on the investigation. But then in the call, he tells her that a friend of his... Um, is actually staying at the next location or is he the owner of the, I was confused about this because there's like, I think two different names here and what it really doesn't matter. Whatever. (laughs) His friend is at this next location and is asking for Nancy to come investigate now. Um, And so she promises Carson that she'll go there the next day. So off we go. Next day, we go to the fort, um, and we meet the owner, and he tells us about the history of the fort and how the prisoners here died of, like, maltreatment and now wander around the property as ghosts scaring the guests. Uh, Nancy asks about the most recent ghost sighting, and uh, Mr. Wilbur 
who is, I think, Carson's friend, tells her that just last night someone actually did see a ghost outside, but then that guest, like, immediately left, apparently, because he was so spooked by it, right? And so Nancy is like, oh, was he really spooked, or did he make up the story, and he's one of Mr. Prizer's gang, or was the ghost just another invention of Mr. Prizer that's been scaring the guests, right? Um, and later that night after dinner, I guess they all decide that they're just going to go hang out on the porch to see if they can see any ghosts walking around. Um, but then when they're on the porch, suddenly fireworks start to go off like above them and flaming rockets start to rain down on them. And Nancy gets hit in the arm by one of them. Haunted rockets? fireworks. I thought that this was like, oh, is there like a celebration or something? Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and this is just a random accident. And no, this is a part of the haunting. Okay. <laughs> oh, so painful. So she gets a small burn and she gets, she has to be like treated by a doctor who's also a guest at the hotel. And, you know, while she's receiving medical attention and, and Bess and George comfort her, um, the boys go search the woods for. Uh, whoever set these things off. But of course they don't find anything out in the woods. And so they decide to search again, the woods the next morning and also the dungeons for some reason. Um, Just even though it's spooky dungeon, I guess that had nothing to do with the fireworks, but okay. Um, But like, I guess it's like, there's like also a real, freaking dungeon under this fort or whatever there's like legitimate like a corridor filled with like these stone cells and they're all down there dave locks bess in inside of a cell um because he thought that that would be funny um yeah and like leaves too like yeah, locks leaves, her in fully and leaves. leaves yeah you know um to terrify her and she decides that instead of freaking out because she knows that's what he wants her to do that she's just gonna be chill and wait for them to come back. And in the meantime, she actually ends up finding a trap door inside the cell that she's been locked in. So when they all get back, she's like, look who did something helpful. So they all like come around this trap door and then they open it. And this triggers an explosion and they all get knocked backwards. Um, But everyone's fine. Great. This was just an explosion for no reason to harm no one. I don't know why they couldn't just lock the trap door. Or why they needed to bring an explosion. Like, if you don't want anybody to find out where it goes, just lock it. Because all this really does is delay them. Oh, God. Okay, so they decide... Nancy wants to immediately explore it right after the explosion, but Ned, everybody and Ned says, you need to rest. Remember, because you have a burn on your arm. You need to rest, (laughs) Nancy. Mm, And she agrees. But then also Ned says something ridiculous, which is that past that prisoners in the past must have found this trapdoor and have. in the past disguised themselves as ghosts escaped through the trapdoor to like stop people from coming after them because they were dressed as ghosts that that's how prisoners escaped they didn't just dig this tunnel with this trap door or whatever and they escape through the trap no they dressed themselves as ghosts so now he's saying there were ghosts in the past like fake ghosts in the past for some reason as well as fake ghosts today and that whoever is actually fake haunting this place now must have heard this story about these prisoners who did this in the past okay. and that's why they're doing it here today sure why why is that why does that have to be that it's just why we don't that we have 20 chapters we don't have a whole lot of time to discuss all of this or whatever and we decide to throw in some random theory for what reason it doesn't make it doesn't make any sense so yeah so she has her burn so they all have to take a, a little break and so they go tell the owner about this trap door and i guess this explosion too and so he calls the police And then they decide, well, since the police are on the way, I guess now we can go back and explore. And they go explore with the owner. Okay. So they just immediately go back to explore now. Um, And down in the tunnel, they find this 
collection of seashells that haven't been exploded somehow, even though there was literally just an explosion in this tunnel. They're fine and intact. Um, there's no initials on these shells, but Nancy just knows somehow that they're stolen. Okay. Um, they follow this tunnel all the way down to the end of it, where it ends in a secret door, which opens to the hillside. And so it's clearly, it's like some hidden entrance and exit to this fort. So Nancy just wonders, oh, how's Mr. Prizer? I know Mr. Prizer knows about this. I wonder how. Great. So then Bill starts to talk about how everything is supernatural. Bill's one of the married couples, in case you didn't remember that. I don't know why you would. I don't remember their names either. Um, he's a married couple, one of the married couple, one of the people in one of the couples. Yeah, how do you say that, man? Anyway, I'm sorry. I feel like scat. This book has got me tripping. <laughs> Truly, yeah. Well, <laughs> is it him and Bab? Probably. Is it Bill and Bab? I don't know. Anyway, he starts talking about how everything is supernatural because God created seashells. Um, yeah, just like how he created women to obey. Yeah. <laughs> No, this is clearly, so the text even mentions that Joyce Kilmer, who is like this famous like Catholic poet, um, and that they're saying that basically Bill is just like saying, like mis or like quoting kind of uh, Joyce Kilmer, which is a crazy reference for the Nancy Drew books to make. Yeah. Not because of the Catholicness of it, but because, like, how many times does Nancy Drew actually make, like, a real-life reference to someone? Right. Um, and when and she does, this... it's like Sherlock Holmes, you know, something that would be, children would know who that is, maybe, but this poet, probably not. I had to look up who this was. <laughs> I was like, who is that? Clearly that's somebody that's real, and it is. And it's just like, why is that the reference? It's clearly like someone had a heart on for religion and, like, mm. God. And, yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, this is also, I think, when... Um, Rita makes a comment about how there is still some supernatural things that people can't explain, right? Like that just happened in the world that we have not found an explanation for uh, to this day. And there's an interesting moment with that that we we should just talk about later. I don't want to get into it too much right now, but okay. it's fascinating. So then the police show up, um, and Nancy asks about Steve, and he still hasn't been found. Um, they do tell Nancy, though, that the previous night, Madame Tarantella's tent caught fire and actually burned down, and that witnesses say that they saw the medium's ghost floating in the smoke as it was on fire. So she's That's dead? spooky. Oh, no. <laughs> um... Oh, this is, sorry, this is where it is. So they spend a little bit of time making fun of ghosts in the spirit world, and Rita is just, like, peeved about it. And this is where she says that there are supernatural things that, in the world, that haven't been explained. Um, and then her husband goes, like, true or noted or something, and Nancy says, like, oh, that's probably how he, quote-unquote, closes off debates on the supernatural. So not and that so, he's, you know, as dumb as Rita and actually believes this. He's just agreeing with her to get her to shut up. Well, I, I no, I don't. I think it's more than that. I think it's like that's how he silences her. Like it's yeah. very much like that he closes down the, the conversation. Like he closes the argument because that's his job as a man yeah. to close those arguments because he's the husband and she's the wife and she has to listen to him. And so that's how he does it. He just... Yeah, he needs to just keep the woman in check when she gets too silly with her right. ideas. Right, it's basically like that's how he checks her, by just mm -hmm. being like, right. Absolutely, yeah. Women should stop ah! having their little thoughts. It's so bad, you guys. It's so bad. I know you guys might think, like, they're, they're probably being a little dramatic. Like, it's probably, this is probably not that bad. But you need to read this book if you think that, because holy geez, we haven't even yeah. talked about the um, uh, Dave and Bert um, steak Oh, thing. the He-Man <laughs> meat. He-Man meat. He-Man meat. <laughs> uh, anyway, so 
you have that to look forward to if you choose. Um, <laughs> so then this is where Nancy has like her realization. She realizes that every single time they get to a new place, then something happens. Oh, really? Go, go figure, Nancy. Um, and so she wants to try to sneakily make it to their next location, which is the collector's house, without advertising it and get there before the bad guys and try to set a trap for them. So they decide to split up their group. Um, and Nancy, Ned, Helen, and Jim are going to be driven to this collector's house in a truck while the rest of everybody else stays back at the fort. Um, and Ned says that it's because he and Jim can keep Helen and Nancy safe because they're men like he kept her safe from almost getting drowned mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. okay. just like that yeah. um, so they all go um, and they're in this truck and on their way to this house a speeding car passes by them and goes to the fort and delivers a note to the others who are still there and it's actually an urgent message for Nancy and so they decide to open it because Nancy's not there um, and it's basically just a threat uh, saying that she needs to stay off the highways too late. So <laughs> they, this is when they all decide to pray for Nancy. Yeah. Um, Need to have a prayer circle going to make sure Nancy right. reaches her destination. Yeah. Um, well, Rita actually says that they need to try to psychically communicate a message to her, but then everybody else just turns it into prayer time. Um, yeah. And Nancy suddenly gets the feeling that they're being followed. We know you did that, Rita. Thank you. <laughs> and indeed, a car. I actually really hate this because it's definitely not played off as like, oh, yeah, Rita actually successfully made a psychic connection with Nancy and did this. It's played off like it's like divine intervention. Yeah. That instead of Nancy being able to like just use her own intuition or just being observant, that because the others prayed, yeah. She realized that someone was following them. Yeah. No, it was the power of prayer. Absolutely. Oh, my God. Uh, why? Uh, Nancy is a detective. Why can't we have her have a moment of detecting something? Detecting a car following them. Why are we not allowed? Why does it have to be about prayer? Why does it have to be about God? It makes no sense. They've never yeah. done this before. I've never seen this before in any other Nancy Drew book. That's yeah. wild. I mean, we have mentions of her, like, we have to go to church first because it's Sunday. Right. But, but that's because but that's Nancy it. is, right. That's because Nancy has to be the quote unquote good girl, right? She is the ideal, right? Idealized. So morally, that's why. And so I can understand church as being a symbol of morality, of Nancy's morality. That's why she right. goes is because Nancy's an inherently moral but, but like we've never gotten anything beyond us she went to church and now she's proceeding with the mystery right yeah right but this is like here's the whole sermon we got here's the prayers that Bess and george are saying for nancy this is what nancy you know and we're even like giving like a, a spiritual like religious explanation to nancy being able to solve the mystery now yeah. all glory to god <laughs> we should put that on a t-shirt <laughs> except yeah, I don't know was, I don't know how people would realize but that it would it was sarcastic but that would be so funny have you seen side note oh, total aside this is not relevant to anything but have you seen like those shorts where people are writing on it I forget what bible verse it is somewhere in Matthew or something but it's like if your eyes cause you to sin like they put this on booty oh, shorts right? your eyes or whatever like, gouge out your like own on eyes the butt. yes on the ass <laughs> yes I love it I want some so bad anyway um so yeah so Nancy sees this car following them um and so they like vary their speed and the car matches their speeds so they're like okay it's definitely following us um luckily they spot a farmhouse and they quickly pull in there and like turn off their lights and the car zooms past them Whew. um but then it actually the car then reverses and pulls into the farmhouse behind them mm. got Great. it you don't take the end here? Sure. <laughs> um, so this car, it turns out just to be the police. Um, they've been notified of a stolen truck. And so they were following this truck <laughs> just because 
you know, it was driving suspiciously. So they were going <laughs> to check figure. it out. Um, so Nancy explains who they are and what they're doing. And the police are like, yeah, that checks out. Um, you definitely didn't steal this truck. So keep going. Um, <laughs> all good here. So they keep going. Um, and then they finally get to Mr. Crenshaw's or Mr. Cranshaw. I think it's Cranshaw. I specifically looked at it. I was like, not Cranshaw? No, no, no. Cranshaw. Cranshaw. Like cranberry sauce. Yes. Yes. (laughs) So they get to Mr. Cranshaw's house. They ask to be dropped off just a little ways up the road so that, like, nobody can see them coming, I guess. And then um, says, can you just come back in, like, two hours to come come get us? Um, And he's like, sure, go on. Um, I just just deleted the part about how he gets, um, like – carjacked because it's just not relevant (laughs) it's not relevant nothing ever comes of it because he comes back anyway yeah it literally doesn't matter so i just deleted it from the summary (laughs) so he drops them off they start walking up to the house um but they decide to walk around the back first and like look through the windows um so they're looking through the window of i guess into the living room and it's just like all creepy rows of skulls all lit up as well um and there's also a stingray hung above the mantle and it has glowing eyes and nancy makes a remark that she thinks it looks like it's blinking um so they walk when they walk back around to the front of the house they ring the bell and the butler jeffers um answers the door and they ask him if they can come inside and see mr cranshaw's collection um jeffers is like um i mean i'll go ask that's kind of weird. I mean, he's not really like seeing visitors right now, but I'll go ask. So he makes him wait on the doorstep, but then he comes back, lets them in and says, um, you know, Mr. Cranshaw's not feeling well. He's upstairs in bed, but he said, you're welcome to just like have a look around anyway, but you know, you can't see him, but you can see his stuff. Um, so they go into the, the, the weird room. Um, they keep calling it the weird room. Um, and they go and they look <laughs> at the skulls and the sting, the stingray. Um, and then there's a bunch of cabinets with shells in them as well. Hmm. Um, so Jeffers leaves them for a minute and then while they're looking around, you know, they make some remarks about the skulls and everything. Um, and then he comes back and says, Mr. Cranshaw says that he really wants you to see some of the stuff in the basement. He's got some really rare stuff in there. He used to be this big game hunter. So you'll definitely want to check out what's in the basement. Um, so they're like, yeah, absolutely. Let's go. Yeah. So they go downstairs and there's a dinosaur skeleton in a cage. <laughs> And then, mind you, all these skeletons that they have are, like, reconstructed to actually look like the skeleton shape. But then each one is in an iron cage. So that it This can't... is the big game he was hunting. He was hunting dinosaurs. He's yeah. that old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, obviously this is just like Jurassic Park. They have to be in a cage so that when they come to life at night, they don't escape. And... <laughs> Eat you like a velociraptor. Um... <laughs> Oh my god, this is so funny. Why are they in cages? Who had custom cages built for his basement so he could display his dinosaurs? Also, what is the size of this basement? How tall are the ceilings in this basement? How many stairs did they have to walk down in order for a a reconstructed dinosaur skeleton to fit into a cage? How big is the cage? Maybe it's like Is it like an airplane hanger? Like, what? Yeah, I it mean, would have even to be it, huge. I mean, unless it's a small dinosaur. I mean, <laughs> I don't some know. dinosaurs I guess... could be very small, but <laughs> that's true. You know, that's true. I'm being sizest about dinosaurs. <laughs> well, I mean, it, I, we think of dinosaurs. They were, on average, they were very, very large. There were <laughs> some small ones that you know could be like human sized or even smaller, but like, okay, it's okay. still very weird. Um, <laughs> So, but then I guess there's another cage, and in the cage is just, like, big slabs of fossils. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we need to lock that up um, so it can't escape. (laughs) But um, then Jeffers is like, oh, let me unlock this cage for you, because these are really, really cool. Come step inside here and get a closer look. (laughs) Just get inside the cage. Get in the cage. Everybody go. Everybody, all of you, all four (laughs) of you, inside the cage. (laughs) Don't worry, nothing weird is going on. So they're like, yeah, we can trust you. They step inside the cage. He immediately slams the door behind them and locks them in. So they turn he around. He also starts, starts laughing maniacally, too. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. You fell for it. <laughs> That's too good, you guys. That's too good. And then he says, Nancy Drew, you and your friends will soon also be skeletons, too, for interfering oh, with God. my plans. 
<laughs> so he won't say he won't say like who their plans are or like who is the they or what the plans are. He just leaves. Um this is great. This is great. So they find they manage to find this like panel that's in the wall and they are able to like shimmy the panel aside so that there's just enough space between the edge of the bars of the cage and the wall itself. It's just big enough for Ned to scoot through. So he goes, he scoots through, and then they're like, wait, the other three of us can't leave this, the cell because he'll be back and he'll know that we've escaped. So they like all hide behind the dinosaur and then he comes back and he's like, where are you guys? And they're like, oh, we're just behind the dinosaur. And he's like, let me see you, all of you. And so they pop up one at a time and are like, I'm here. I'm Nancy. I'm here. I'm Helen. And then um, Jen, <laughs> Jim just pretends to be himself and Ned. Just like combs his hair to the side and is like, no, I'm Ned now. <laughs> so he's satisfied with the four of them still being in the cage and he leaves again. Um, and then they all climb out of the weird panel in the wall. Um, and then so they are exploring the basement a little bit further and they find that Steve, the teenage boy, is locked up in another one of the cages. Um, so at this point, Jeffers comes back downstairs and because they've all escaped the, well, everybody except for Steve, they've all escaped at this point. They're managed to like jump him, tie him up, take his keys and then free Steve from that cage. Um, so then they go back upstairs to talk to Mr. Cranshaw who is in bed and he's very hard of hearing apparently. So he's very surprised to see them. Apparently he was unaware that there were even guests in the house. Um, but they explain why they're there and they tell him what Jeffers has just done. And they tell him that, you know, you've had your shell stolen from you. It's most likely that Jeffers is your invisible intruder. He's just been stealing from you. Um, so Mr. Cranshaw has a hard time believing this because he says that he's seen a ghost walking around his bedroom and he always thought that it was the ghosts that were stealing. Um, and Nancy says, no, that was just a hoax. Um, no ghosts. Sorry about ya. But like, she doesn't ask any questions about this. She's just like, no, it was probably not. It's probably just a yeah. robot. Like, like we saw a robotic octopus. It's probably just a robot. Or one of those vapor things with the gas. <laughs> or the, you know, human balloon. <laughs> Yeah, it's the one sex of those. toy balloon that we put oh, a sheet God. over. <laughs> yeah, so um, they go downstairs, and Nancy and Ned hear the stingray talking. <laughs> you guys, this is off the rails. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Um, it turns out to just be a walkie-talkie, like, behind yeah. the stingray, and it's, like, so. <laughs> it's asking for a code word. And Steve tells them that he heard Jeffers say the word invisible intruder once. So Ned comes over and, like, tries to disguise his voice, and he's like, invisible intruder. And it works. <laughs> um, and the other person on the other end is like, correct, I'll be there at midnight. <laughs> oh, thank you for telling us the time of your arrival. Now we can call oh. the police and have them here ready at midnight. So that's what Nancy does. And it turns out our bad guys are none other than Mr. Prizer Sr., Mr. Prizer Jr., Lady Prizer, we don't get her name, um, and nope. then Madame Tarantella as well. Um, and then there's some other guys as well who are not named, but just other members of this gang. Um, so everyone is in hiding, including the police. And of course, they they hear all about their dastardly plans. They lay everything out, confess to basically everything. Um, they talk about how Madame Tarantella fooled Nancy, how it was actually a friend of hers who happened to be spying on Carson for an unrelated reason while Carson and Nancy were just chilling in the backyard. And that's when Nancy went to Carson and was like, hey, can I have permission to go on the ghost hunting trip? So they got all the plans from that. Um, we learned that Madame Tarantella is the cousin of Mr. Prizer. So that's how they know each other and how they got into this together. She brings out several thousand dollars that she's collected from selling the the shells that they've stolen. Um, and Mr. Prizer starts talking about all of his inventions and his fake hauntings. And he explains how he invented radios to fit into the shells of these seashells. This is all bizarre. Um, That's also even, like we never was. When did we find a radio inside of a shell? We never did that. Like, why are you telling us that? Like, why did you not talk about the octopus that you made? Yeah. Tell me about that or how the canoe works, dude. Like, that's yeah. what I want to know. <laughs> I know no. how a radio works. Thank you. Like, <laughs> yeah, we understand the walkie talkie was inside the stingray. We get it. Thank is you. Is this like we, the the shell thing? Is this like a shell phone like joke? Like, are you trying to to like make a like a 
a phone oh, that gosh. looks like a shell. It was just a radio. Like, cause <laughs> call me on my shell phone. Great. Uh, <laughs> so as they're, you know, basically confessing to everything unprompted, the police are like, ha ha, gotcha. So they spring out, arrest everybody. Um, and Madame Tarantella starts cursing Nancy and saying that she hopes her grandfather actually will haunt her for doing <laughs> all God. this. Um, and as she's being led away, Nancy asks her, why did you give me all those papers? And she says that even so, even though she hates Nancy, she trusts her. Why does she hate Nancy, first <laughs> this of all? makes no sense. Apparently, her cousins tried to swindle her out of the shell money, um, and she didn't want them getting to her papers, which the papers were just proof that they were the ones c- committing the crimes. Um but yeah, then they all get arrested and led away, and Mr. Cranshaw invites the ghost hunting group to stay. The end. We solved it. Did we, though? I have so many questions. <laughs> mm. It just doesn't make any sense. There, are, The thing is, is that there are too many plot holes for me to even begin to start so bringing them up and trying to unpack them. So I'm not going to do that, because I feel like they should be pretty obvious to everybody at this point, for the most part, anyway. Um, but it's so instead, I want to talk about what I feel like this book is actually about. Um, and that's sexism. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I just, okay. Like, first the of all, I want to read the book. <laughs> the, <laughs> I want to read the man meat part because it's so oh. funny. He man meat. Let me hold on. Hold on. Hold on. So they're ordering dinner because this is a camp where apparently you can do that. It's super fancy. Also, we have to talk about in general the fact, I think we kind of have before a little bit, but the fact that adults, adult people just go to camp, can just enroll in like a camp yep. where there's just activities. I need this in my I life. Go. I, w- yeah. I want to go to camp. We should we should talk about that. Anyway, we, should, we, we should go to before. camp. <laughs> Together? Uh, we've talked about having a, a summer camp when uh, we would start oh, it you're and right. have like events you're right. and stuff. Yeah, we have. We would be yeah, good yeah, at yeah. that. We would be excellent at that. Anyway, so they're ordering dinner and the waiter is like, oh, we have roast beef. How do you like your roast beef? And the girls chose medium, so demure, while the boys wanted it rare. Bert grinned, raw meat for the he-men. <laughs> I might, might. Gosh. I'm so I exhausted. Mean, What's wrong with truly, these men? It's truly tiring. And they even say after that, or George, sorry, George comments, you'll need it to conquer the spooks. Because because you need raw meat. You need you, the men need the fuel. And and if your meat is cooked a little bit longer, then it's not as nutritious. And that's why women eat meat. Actually, I don't know that you knew this, Corey, but that's why women tend to eat meat that has been more thoroughly cooked. It's not because, oh, you know, we don't like the taste of raw meat, maybe. We're not right. freaking animals. No, it's because we don't need, um, we don't actually need that much nutrition because we're just supposed to spend our time just sitting while the men do all the hard work. Yeah. yeah. So I don't I don't know if you knew that. Why would we want calories? At all yeah. costs, we need to reduce the number. We of have calories to burn the calories off the meat, right. so that by the time we eat it, it's less because we have to be less because we're women. Yeah, well, exactly. And the men have to be <laughs> these super strong ghost hunting he men. <sighs> I mm. promise you guys, when when we talked about starting a podcast, I really didn't expect it to turn into feminism one on one. It's just, apparently, it's got to be. I don't know. Apparently, it was necessary, yeah. (laughs) Uh, Okay, so what was the other thing you were going to say about the second part with Rita that was... So, I want to read that part, too, because it's not the way that they have that conversation that irritates me so much. It's the way that Nancy responds to that that conversation. So, um... When the laughter died down, they discussed what the next step in their ghost hunting should be. And Ned's like, we don't, we know who did it, but we just don't know how to get to them or whatever. And then Rita declared that she was not convinced of this. I believe in spirits. Don't forget, there are many ghostly happenings in this world that haven't been explained. Granted, 
her husband agreed. It seemed to Nancy and her friends, I didn't realize it said this, but it says it seemed to Nancy and her friends that this was the way that Rod invariably closed off debates on the supernatural. Mm-hmm. So it's like, first of all, it's an acceptance of all of them that it is the right order for the husband to be in control of the debates and the topics that they discuss Mm -hmm. between them as a couple. It's just accepted. It's just granted. And that not only is it that because Rita is silly or whatever for believing in all of this stuff, it's that she's like going against her husband. Yeah. Who needs to be shot down because she shouldn't be disobeying him that way. Exactly. Like, I mean, I mean, like, I could understand, like, from earlier when you were talking about how there's that moment between them after the canoe accident with Ned and Nancy, um, and he is basically like, shut up, let's go inside, but it's okay that you shamed me. Mm. I could even understand that as being an example of, like, like, yes, he's an asshole clearly like a patriarchal moment or whatever but the way that that in that moment the second instance of that is like socially accepted Mm -hmm. is just like uh like that gets to me so much more than that first one because it's like it's so much more subtle too like it's so much less of a big deal to everybody right because Mm -hmm. before it was like nancy and ned got into this accident and so everybody is kind of like keyed up or whatever and so when that happens it's like attention is paid to rita but like in this moment it's just like she's just absolutely cast aside about for this reason and everybody just accepts that because her husband gets to tell her no Right. Oh, yeah. The the level of internalized misogyny that Nancy yes. and George would, and Helen even would all have to have for them to see this moment and then them all go, yeah, of course it went that way. That's how it's supposed to go because men should be silencing us. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why that makes me the most mad. Um, it's also just like, why is it that I... Why can't it be flip-flopped? Why can't we have the men going on and on about ghosts or whatever and Rita being a quiet voice of, are we sure this is real? Um, mm. like, wh- like, what if it were like that and Rita was continually being silenced and then Nancy could stick up for her friend and believe in Rita and be on Rita's side? And better. that would, would that not be yeah. so much better? Um, but because it's almost like, because it's a woman, she has to have this fringe belief and has to be proven oh, yeah. wrong. Uh, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's coded in her gender. And even the way that like Bess gets scared of everything, it's like, because she's a girl and girls get scared. Yeah. That's what it, that's what set, that's what this whole premise is. And it was Helen's idea to come on this ghost hunting tour. And, like, it's just, like, it's wild to me that we spend, we set up this whole premise based on the ideas of these women because they think it'll be fun or whatever. And then we just spend the entire time just essentially just shitting on their ideas and their beliefs and what they think is going to be fun. This is what I was going to talk about before is something that Bess actually says at the very beginning of the book, when they, um, they come over to Nancy's house, um, to talk about the ghost hunting trip. And she says, um, Oh gosh. Uh, okay. So, um, Helen Bess comes up. She says, this trip sounds scary. Um, And Helen looks surprised, like, do you want to back out? And Dave answers for her. Mm -hmm. First of all, Dave answers for Bess. And he says, "Um, you know perfectly well Bess isn't going to back out. She wouldn't miss helping to solve a mystery for anything. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't either. But if Bess won't go, that means I can't. Okay, so it's okay that he answers the question for her because he's being gallant. Okay. (laughs) So annoying. But then... Here we go. Bess made a face at him. You people are all so serious. Can't I have a little fun pretending to be scared? 
Isn't that such an interesting comment from Bess? It's so telling. It's like Bess is the only one who sees everything that's going on. Yeah. Here. So Bess is saying like, no, 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 no. This We're having fun. This is supposed yeah. to be fun, Dave. Like we're supposed to be the idea of having this ghost hunt. It's not because, I mean, sure, maybe it is because we believe in ghosts or spirits or whatever. But it also is like we want to go on a fun trip. Can we have a fun trip? Can we have right. a little fun pretending to be scared and talking about ghosts and experiencing all of this without you coming in and pretending like, you are all big and powerful and stronger and no better and all that stuff. Beth says it. She says it right there. But then throughout the rest of the book, that's all it is. Is yeah. the men running around crashing canoes out of attics and chasing boats. And it's like, <laughs> why? Like, clearly, I mean, it's just so, it's just wild to me. These gender dynamics, man. It's, I, Yeah. I almost think the whole thing with Bess is one of the most interesting part of the books because we have that scene with the medium who like tells her mm -hmm. that she's going to be getting her marriage license soon. But right before that, we have the scene where Dave is speaking for her. Bess mm -hmm. says, no, 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 I can't get married yet. Dave is done with, isn't done with school yet. We have to wait until he's done with school. Never mind what Bess has going on and the reasons True. why she might have her own timeline in her life. Um, and then, you know, we have this thing at the end where he locked, I mean, one of the like few best scenes. <laughs> yes. All he locks of them her in a cage. He locks her in a cage and then leaves her there. Just leaves her there like in it's funny. In a haunted funny. dungeon. Yeah. Because he thinks it's funny. And this Listen. is the man that she's supposed to be tying herself to? That's not the treatment that she deserves. Not by a long no. shot. Mm -mm. Mm. I didn't even think about that in the context of like Dave and Bess's relationship. I just thought about it in the wider, like, social concept. Like, of course, a man thinks it's funny to lock the girl in the cage and mm -hmm. have her freak out or whatever. But, yeah. Like, especially considering that. It's like, wow. And also, like, we you know, like, like we as the reader are reading this as being like, yes, this is the expected relationship. This is how it's supposed to go. This is what the man does when he likes a girl. Mm -hmm. He teases her. He locks her in a cage. Yeah. <laughs> he locks her in a haunted cage. Oh, how romantic. <laughs> well, and then you have that juxtaposed with like, here is Nancy's only married friend. And then we mm -hmm. have these brand new, these three brand new married couples. The only new people that we meet are these married couples. There's no like mm -hmm. single or dating people on this trip at all. And to have it be like, it's almost like a mirror of like best, Nancy and George, this is what your future You're is going right. to look like once you get married. Oh That's my what gosh. it's supposed to reflect, I think. And Rita and Rod are Dave and Bess 10 mm -hmm. years in the future. Exactly. And wow. so we have this whole dynamic of like, Bess, you need to be thinking about marriage because when Dave is ready, you're going to have to be expected ready. to fulfill this role. Yeah. And he's going to lock you ready. in an actual cage. He locks you in an actual cage. Mm -hmm. And in the future, he's going to lock you in a metaphysical cage. Yep. <laughs> the cage of marriage, of matrimony. Yes. yes. Wow. I'm so grateful to not be a woman in the 60s. My God. Especially yeah. a young woman. Yeah. That, yeah, I feel like marriage <sighs> is like the, the hidden theme of this with the, the mm -hmm. sex and everything. It's... It's like almost a cautionary tale. It's scary in well, that but respect. It's so, I think it's so interesting, though, because I don't think it is a cautionary tale. I no, think it's I mean, training. No, this no, it is, is. It is. This yeah, is, it's this 100%. is telling little girls, this is what you have to look forward to. This is the right. dynamic that marriage is, is about. Because there's no, there's like, because ultimately the message is like, the men are right. The men are helpful. The men do, do protect the women. Um, the men are necessary. They always have to be a part of every single, um, you know, action in this or whatever. Um, we have to worry about the men. The men don't worry about us. We take care of the men, even though the men do keep us safe, right? We do know the men keep us safe. Spoiler alert. They do not keep us safe. Um, no. uh, they actually, a actually they terrorize us by locking us into cages, uh, <laughs> leave when we are about to be violently attacked. Um, they are the ones who are violently attacking us. Also, um, all of this happens in the, like, this is not an exaggeration. Like that's what happens in the book, yeah. but somehow still the message is the men protect us. The men come with us, but we have to be concerned and care about the men. 
we have to make sure that we are not being too loud around the men. We have to make sure that we are talking about appropriate subjects around the men. We also have to make sure that we are separate from the men, that we sleep in separate places, that we eat different foods, that we, mm-hmm. um, that we, we send them off to do the hard work while we stay behind. They chase after the bad guys. We ask them to chase after the bad guys. Um, you know, they will speak for us and we will let them and be happy with that. Um, you know, like all of this stuff, it's yep. just in there. Um, it feels so, like, a, okay, Nancy, Bess, and George, you're young, you're having fun. Um, mm-hmm. But all of this, you going and, you know, having time with your friends, you it's having too agency, you doing all these things that are fun and just going off on trips. This is just, you know, it's temporary. this is your last hurrah. It's going away as soon as you get married, which is going to be very soon, by the way, next couple of years here. And then mm-hmm. the rest of your life is going to be, look at these other three women that are on this trip yeah. with you. Yeah. It's temporary and it's preparation for your future. And this is a yeah. snapshot of what it's going to be. Yeah. yeah. And the reason, and here we go, here we go. The reason why you should like it and be excited is because why, Corey? It's because that's the way that God made it. Yes. Because this book is also about religion. Yeah. This book oh, is we're also... definitely <laughs> obeying our husbands the way that wives should. We are nothing but, you know, just a little fragment of his rib that we're just there to mm-hmm. reflect him. Yeah. Because literally, so we have that that little bit where Bill starts talking about how everything is supernatural. Okay, I got to find that too. Oh, yeah. We have to because that section. This was wow. so convoluted and bizarre. So, did I hear you right, Rita Spoka? Bill, you said everything in the world is supernatural. And he said, that's right. Everyone listened attentively as he went on. Think of the millions of things around you. A clam shell, for instance. Only God can make a clam. He said, paraphrasing Joyce Kilmer. Essentially, what this is, is this is a mini sermon that we're listening to also. Yeah. His audience nodded and Bill went on. You probably think of clams as being plentiful and common. There are many varieties that aren't seen often. Take the man-eating clam as an example. Man-eating clam, Bess exclaimed. Where do you get that? He talks about the man-eating clam. Um, talks more about the man-eating clam. We get a lot of education Helen about asks, clams. Helen asks how a clam could eat a man. And then Bill says, personally, I don't believe it does because the clam is slow at closing and one would have plenty of time to get out of the way. Talks about Tridacna gigas can carry a pearl as large as a golf ball. Anyway, (laughs) he says, okay, so the world is vast and wide and wonderful because God created it. And so because God created everything, everything is supernatural maybe even including the relationship between men and women Mm. (laughs) and how women are supposed to submit. Right. I don't know. That might be like an extrapolation, but it just, it feels like very much like, okay, so we're talking about all of this. We even talk about the crime in the context of religion, but now we're talking about just everything, literally all of creation, all of the world, I shouldn't say creation, all of the world in the lens of the fact that, God created it. And so supernatural stuff, God created it. Everything, God created it. And that is, and so it's supernatural. And so, so it just, it just seems to me that like, so really ultimately at the core of this, what this is, is one big story about morality and how everything has to be couched in like the concepts of the fact that God created the world And so this is how it is supposed to be. Um, This is normal and natural, even though it's not like, you know, all of of these things are like definitely man created, you know, the concept of jail that's created by men, Um, you know, like, (laughs) or uh, like robots, like God didn't create robots, you know, like Mr. Prizier created the robots, but No, actually, instead, what we're talking about, we're not talking about the fact that a bad guy created all this stuff to terrorize these people and try to get money. We're talking about the fact that God created seashells. Yeah, great. What? What? Okay. Like, why? Why, why, why? 
And it's just because we have to put God in here somehow and, and make it make everything about this like religious message. And so making everything that these people say or do good and something that we should want to emulate Mm -hmm. instead of the bad guys. Because it also we have that scene in the sermon where they're talking about how stealing's bad and, and there's different kinds of stealing or like ruining someone's reputation as a kind of theft and stuff like that. And it's like, uh, like, so I get that as like saying like, well, the bad guys are bad because they're doing the stealing. But now this is saying that like the good guys are good because of God. I don't know. It just feels very, it's just wild. Yeah. <laughs> it's just gross and wild. I don't want to say anything <clears throat> that would be, um, too judgmental or no. dis- dismissive or anything by by any right. means because everybody's entitled to their own beliefs absolutely. absolutely but i think we are all very much aware that there is a sect of nancy drew fans that are extremely religious and go into utter hysterics at the slightest mention of ghosts um or mm. anything supernatural or anything not you know um holy <laughs> so okay. i wonder if if this, this is just written for Harriet, them. Right. If Harriet's right. writing the book in this way, in, in a way to say that, no, I do believe this, and I think that this is how mm-hmm. the world should be, and I want my readers to grow up shaped by these ideas, or if it's just a response of like, a, I'm going to preemptively curb the response of these people that are going to, you know, give backlash to these suggestions that, oh, maybe a ghost could have done it, even though that's clearly not the point of the mystery. There's no point in the mystery where Nancy ever thinks it could be a real ghost or, right. or, or real ghost or something that's really haunting or supernatural or anything like that. I wonder how much of it is actually what she believed or how much was just like, I mean, because back in the 60s, I'm sure that that group of of nancy drew fans was the same way back then as well Mm -hmm. maybe even a larger Mm -hmm. group um i know that they still exist today but again i'm not judging anybody if that's right if that's your belief system then that's that's totally fine there's you know but and i also yeah i want to clarify too that i don't mean that like you know i'm not trying to knock anybody who believes in god (laughs) and religion and divine intervention even you know uh, god knows i believe enough weird crap (laughs) world that I should talk about that but I just think when you use it in a book to create like to write this kind of like prescriptive like this is how it has to be Mm -hmm. um that's danger zone that's where it gets dangerous and gross to me and it also just seems like we've never had this in another Nancy Drew before like this just feels so unusual to me um that it just feels unnecessary um and so I just don't get it I just don't I just don't understand why we have to have this when historically all we've had are you know, cute little mysteries that Mm -hmm. don't, but now suddenly it's a religious message. Yeah. That has to be That feels problematic to me. Like it feels like, and also, and also somehow that it's, it's so paired with like the sexist nature of everything that's going on in this. That feels that I hate that. I hate it. Yeah. I hate it. As someone who grew up in the church, I just, it, it, and who has experienced things like that, uh, directly, it it makes me mad. Yeah. Um, and it, it makes me mad that, like, as a little girl, I would have read this and not seen a problem with it. That, um, in fact, it would go hand in hand with a lot of the things that I was taught um, to believe in. And how the patriarchy is so ingrained in the Christian religion and in the concept of marriage and of women being subservient to men and how that is a sermon that I have heard before, um, that was preached to me as a child in church. Um, and how I believed things like that, um, having to be subservient of my mom quoting, um, my big fat Greek wedding about the man being the head of the house and the woman being the neck, like, I mean, just things that are just so problematic and just so triggering to me. Um, That's why I am responding so strongly to this. Not because I don't think that people should believe in God. Um, (laughs) You know, I just don't think it should be used to... 
to control people? Mm-hmm. To control women. Yeah. 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 Exactly. We've had, <laughs> I mean, there's countless books of Nancy Drew of, oh, people think this thing is haunted. And then Nancy's the one that comes in and proves that it's, you know, X, Y, Z bad guys. It's really a person doing whatever it is. Right. But it's never mm-hmm. been paired with this level of. Right prayer and sermons Mm -hmm. and preachy attitudes about how things should work. It it just doesn't, I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me, especially with like the Nancy Drew ghost stories. Those are supposed to be about ghosts. We never have this level of churchiness associated with it. I could like literally go through and like name every single one of them that has a ghost, like hidden staircase has a ghost. Um, Secret of shadow ranch has a ghost Uh whispering statue. That's that's that was slightly haunted. To be ghostly. And yeah. even at the end of that, we kind of leave it ambiguous. That one doesn't yeah. come down hard on the fact no supernatural haunted bridge ghost. Uh, I think Clue the Tapping Heels has ghosts yeah. too, which is right after that. Um, let's see, uh, Tolling Bell ghost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, ghost of Blackwood Hall. Uh, like so, like that's just within that's a, the that's first twenty five. That's the first 25, and that's, like, so Maybe many. Maybe because Mildred was still writing back then. I guess. <laughs> but, like, do, I mean, like, I don't know. It, it's just, yeah, it's wild to me that, like, that's this is the take. Especially, yeah. like you're saying, like, after so many books where, like, that's a theme, and it just feels like that. this is, this, and this is just such a, a judgment of it. Yeah. It's such a, why would you even consider believing in ghosts? When it's like, well, clearly we have considered believing in ghosts. Like, we just, we read all these mysteries about ghosts. Like, I don't understand. I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't get it either. Oh. Well, what else we got? I mean, I mean, I don't know, man. This book is so off the rails. It's tiring. But I think... It is, honestly, I'm sitting here yawning, first of all, because I'm tired in general, but just also because this best, this, this best, this book, I'm just tired of thinking about. Yeah. I wanted it to be so much. I was so excited. I was like, yes, we're going to go to all these different, finally, a book about haunting. And it's like, okay, it is, but also, mm. it's definitely not. <laughs> so disappointing. The hauntings weren't even spooky. No, uh, the worst, the absolute worst. All we read these books for are for vibes anyway. We don't yeah. even get them. <laughs> yeah, there was no get em. good vibes in this one. At least Tolling Bell had some like good, nice, spooky vibes. This is just like, it's just ridiculous. There was never a part where I was like, oh, that's so <laughs> mysterious and spooky. It's like, wow, that's absurd. Okay. <laughs> I did. I think that we got really close to the vibes. I liked the vibes at the summer camp. At oh yeah, camp, the summer camp was fine. But after that, called. everything just went way further away from what yeah. we were trying to do. I think they did really well with the ghost at the summer camp. Not the canoe so much. I thought the canoe was really lame. But no, the ghost in the woods, I thought that that was really good, spookily done, and the way that they deconstructed that afterwards, I thought was excellent. It was like, yes. great, we're getting like actual detective work in here for once. Like Nancy f- like goes and searches the wood and she finds a clue and she examines the clue. And that leads her to another location where we get another clue. And so that felt very, that felt good to me, but the rest of it, yeah, it's just bad. I don't have anything else. Yeah. <laughs> well, flashlight score. I mean, a one. Yeah. This one's real bad. Yeah, I was, I was hopeful. Well. I was hopeful that I'd be able to say like it's a fun Halloween book. It's not. No, there are way better other Nancy Drew books that you could and should read around Halloween time. This is not the one. Go read the ghost stories. Those those aren't even good, but it's better than no, this. <laughs> it really is because at least there's no like weird like sermons that you yeah. have to read. So. Yeah, I think one. I, I, yeah. I can't rate it higher. Yeah, I'd say a one. That's a Woo. shame. It's a shame. <laughs> it Anything is. with like spooky, ghosty, I mean, cobwebs covered, or skulls covered in cobwebs on the cover here. So promising. Nope. <laughs> Sad. Um, unfortunately, next up. Oh, um, I forgot that that's the next thing. <laughs> 
Oh, no. We may not be able to rate that one very highly either because it's uh, we're going to uh, we're going to cover Midnight in Salem. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> we're giving you a stinker after stinker. The, and The um, most recent Horror Interactive PC game, Midnight in Salem, we are going to be covering that next episode. Neither Corey or I are very excited about it. In fact, Corey can't even play it. Um, yeah, I don't have because... a computer that it works on, so I'll just be <laughs> watching Ar- Argothumb do his playthrough of it for this one. Thank you for that, Argothumb. Yeah. He was very useful to me, too, when I was trying to do another one. Oh, the, I think, maybe one of the DS games. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. But, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're going to bring that next. Um, you know, I, I, I'm trying to think of something positive I could say about it. Um... <laughs> Brittany Cox is I, great. Brittany yeah, Cox is yeah. great. We love voice her. Voice acting is excellent. Um, uh, Frank I mean, and Joe are in it. The directing for the voice acting was terrible. So Sure. But Frank and Joe Frank are, and in are in it. We get Deirdre We can talk about Frank back. and Joe. Deirdre. There are some uh-huh. of our favorite characters, so we could talk about them. Um, There's lots of Ned drama in like a good way. Like things I that we don't can, even should talk remember Ned about. about. Yeah. So that'll be fun to rediscover that. I did. I have played this before, and I did not enjoy my first playthrough, um, and I haven't played it since. And, yeah, I've only played um, it one time as well when it came out. Yeah. Um, so join us next time as we talk about all that. And yeah. Is it too late to cancel <laughs> that? Can we just do the next episode of the CW show instead? Because that turned oh. out to be... Why did the CW show turn out to be way exceeding my expectations and all the other three that we've done for this are, like, trash? How did this I happen? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, um, just kidding. We're still going to do Midnight Salem. We will. Yeah. It is also something that is exciting. Um, also, uh, part of our little theme here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, well, <laughs> we do have some news. Um, and if you haven't solved our most recent puzzle, then you are going to hear about it right now. Um, all of these episodes, the reason why we've chosen all of these different topics is for a very particular reason. Uh, do you want to tell them, Corey? Yes, I'm very excited. This has been um, literally years of planning in the works. <laughs> So we're actually going to be going on a little trip here. Um, If you're not already familiar, the official Nancy Drew fan club, the Nancy Drew Sluice fan fan club that is run by Jennifer Fisher, they do yearly conventions. Actually, I think they do a couple different conventions in different places every year. Mm -hmm. But this year is going to be the Haunted Salem Con. So this is the Nancy Drew convention set in Salem. So we will very soon be on our way to Salem, Massachusetts to go see all the spooky things and hopefully (laughs) meet a bunch of you guys. Hopefully we'll see you there. So if you're going to plan on attending, let us know so that we can, you know, meet you there. Yes. Be so much Very fun. excited. Very yeah. excited to meet everyone. Very excited to explore Salem. I've been to Salem once before and I loved it. Uh, so I'm very excited to go back and do some more exploring with all of our Nancy Drew pals. Yes. Yeah. So we are, um, our special episode number 70, we are going to be recording some content from the convention. So look out for a little, um, you know, an episode all about the convention and how that went and everything that we got to experience. Because it looks like, um, again, Jennifer Fisher, who's planning all of this, it looks like she has an incredible itinerary prepared for us. Mm -hmm. So I'm very excited. Mm -hmm. I'm very, very excited as well. Um, Yeah. And so we hope you tune in for that uh, regular Drews, but first up is Midnight in Salem. So we've got to make it through that first, uh, but then tune in for episode 70 about the convention. And yeah. I, don't, I don't even think I made it clear. The convention every year chooses like a book to theme around. So this year, the oh, theme right. of it is Tolling Bell, Invisible Intruder, The CW Show, um, and also Midnight in Salem. So they're cramming four different right. topics into this one. So that's why we've covered um, all four of these. <laughs> if it seemed random before, that's why um, we've chosen yeah. to do it in this order. We definitely didn't explain that. But yes, that's, that's why. It is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, um, so good. yeah, we're glad you uh, you hung around for the ride for this one, and we look forward to seeing you hopefully in Salem, uh, but for Midnight in Salem before that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye.
Thank you for listening to Regular Nancy Drew. Email us at regularnancydrew at gmail.com. If you like this episode, make sure to rate, review, and subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram at Regular Nancy Drew and Twitter at Regular ND. You can also support us on Patreon. Patrons at the $3 level vote on upcoming episode topics and get exclusive access to our Scoop Sesh series. And all patrons receive early access to each episode as well as weekly bonus content. And to all you regular Drews out there, thanks, thanks for, for listening. listening.